Welcome back. Uh, thanks for being patient with us with that little item. We had to, you know, sometimes just getting us all together for a quick thing is not an easy thing, so we throw it in the middle and mm -hmm. handle it that way. So appreciate your patience with us. So now we uh, will um, call to order our regular city commission work session of November 30th. Nikki, would you please lead us in the um, Pledge of Allegiance? Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, we'll move on to presentations with the 40th anniversary of the Honeymoon Island um, State Park, and I will turn that over to Commissioner Kynes. Hi, Larry and Tom, could you come forward, please? Larry Franklin and, and Tom DeGard. Larry is currently ch uh, president of our Rotary. Um, the 40th anniversary of Honeymoon Island State Park, whereas the state of Florida purchased 113 acres of the island in 1973, and Honeymoon Island State Park was created on December 7, 1981. And whereas Honeymoon Island State Park receives more than one million visitors annually and has had more visitors than any other state park in Florida for the past six consecutive years. And whereas the Florida Park Service estimates that Honeymoon Island State Park provides more than $30 million of economic impact to Dunedin annually and where, whereas the park opens it do, its doors to visitors from around the world while also hosting local events, and over 500 citizens of Dunedin support the park as friends of the island who are dedicated to preserving and promoting the beauty of the island. And whereas the park is 385 acres in land area with 2,400 tw acres submerged, providing a home for diverse animals and plants that are vital to the ecosystem of Honeymoon Island and beyond. And whereas Honeymoon Island State Park is an iconic feature of the city of Dunedin, contributing to the environmental and economic welfare of this community. Now, therefore, I, Deborah Kynes, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the mayor of the city of Dunedin, Florida, and on behalf of the entire city commission, do hereby proclaim November 30th, 2021, as the 40th anniversary of Honeymoon Island State Park in the city of Dunedin, and we urge everyone to celebrate our beloved state parks and recognize our duty to coexist with their natural wonders so that they can inspire and nurture generations to come. like to say a few words I would just like to thank the city for recognizing the park today it's such a beautiful asset to our community and surrounding communities and not to mention all the out-of-town guests and international guests that visit that park it's just a wonderful place we're very thankful for the park because they support us for 17 years doing our triathlon there and they've been a wonderful asset helping us with that event also thank you thank you Larry Mayor, commissioners, um, we are privileged to live in a wonderful community. Our state park, Honeymoon Island, is one element of that community. I know you work on a week weekly, daily basis making this city great, but that's one of the gems we have in this community. And we're very proud to celebrate with the staff out there and you this day. And I want to thank your staff also in helping us prepare this. They did a great job. Thank you all. Thank you all. Can we make sure that the team over at Honeymoon Island, the state employees, get a copy of that? Sure. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now it's the time for general citizen input. Anything, any item that is not already on the agenda, if you want to come up and speak to it, please feel free. Just give us your name and address for the record. All right. Go to consent agenda. We have the approval of the minutes for October 21st and November 2nd. 
We have board and committee appointments, board of adjustment and appeal, firefighters pension trust board, and youth advisory committee. We have the award of the bid to furnish and install new grit classifier at the wastewater treatment plant. We have the authorization to apply for a non-matching Pinellas County Solid Waste Municipal Recycling Reimbursement Grant. That was a mouthful. Um, and we also have the lien reduction request for the property located at 1775 Briar Circle in the amount of $61,985.98. Um, um, I'm guessing there is at least one item to be pulled. The lien? The lien. Yes? Yes. Anything else? Well, I was wondering what a new grit classifier was. No, just <laughs> please. You don't want to know yeah. what a new grit classifier Mayor. is. Nobody yeah. does. Okay. Mayor, if you could move your microphone closer here. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Justin says so, and you know. You're welcome. All right, so can I have a motion to approve everything except the lien reduction request? So move. Second. Second. Whatever. <laughs> Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner Kynes and Commissioner Tornga, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And we'll go to the lien reduction. George? Yes. And I, I see that you've passed out some pictures. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, George Kinney on behalf of the Community Development Department. Um, so for this particular request, if you recall, we originally had it before you, I think October 19th, if memory serves, at the work session. It's been um, tabled a few times I, since I, to give the applicant mm -hmm. some additional time to um, work on the property, and particularly the secondary violations that were present as of October 19th. Um, I have Chelsea Miller here, uh, who is the code compliance officer that's been working with the applicant and the attorney, and I believe the applicant and attorney are probably here as well. Um, so basically the progress that's been made since the 19th um, all the way through the Wednesday preceding Thanksgiving was gradual, uh, but not to the point where the secondary violations were clear. We did do a site visit again yesterday, Monday, um, and according to our code compliance officer, they are technically um, code, for, uh, code, com uh, code complaint free at this point. Um, but with that understanding, obviously, you see the pictures before you that were taken yesterday. Um, so at this point, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you might have on it or if you want to hear from the applicant. Uh, and also, uh, Code Compliance Officer Chelsea uh, Miller is here as well. Is the recommendation, what's the recommendation? The recommendation is currently for denial, but I think what we suggested to you was if we found that the property was uh, free of secondary violations that we would um, discuss that with you. So, um, Mayor, if you'd like to hear from the applicant then, then and the, their attorney is here, then I'd like to add a little bit to that and make a recommendation to the city commission. Okay, so you do have a recommendation. I do, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody wish to come forward? Please. Commission. We appreciate the commission and city staff giving us the opportunity to follow up and resolve any outstanding uh, concerns. Over the last several weeks, we've worked with city staff, including Ms. Miller and Mr. Kinney, to identify and address any outstanding potential code issues. This included removing many items from the front lawn to improve general aesthetics, cleaning debris from the driveway, reorganizing and removing items uh, from the front porch, and tidying up the yard. In short, we took the commission's direction to ensure complete compliance to heart. I actually spent several hours personally with Ms. Loki physically organizing uh, and removing many items to ensure uh, compliance and improve general aesthetics. Uh, unfortunately, part of the reason that improvement was gradual was my fault. Uh, my wife is a frontline healthcare worker and I have a young son, so a lot of the days in the week I'm caring for him and uh, that includes a lot of the weekends. But I did come out and spend several hours the Wednesday before Thanksgiving actually helping her move and reorganize things myself with Ms. Loki. All of that said, uh, we're committed to keeping the property in compliance going forward and continuing to improve it aesthetically. We appreciate that we have an obligation to maintain the property and ensure that it stays compliant going forward. We also understand and appreciate that this would be a one-time accommodation from the commission we're committed to ensuring that we don't find ourselves before you in this position again. 
We only ask for the opportunity for a fresh start for Mr. Lo or Ms. Loki, excuse me. Ms. Loki has kept her grass, grass maintained, which was the original underlying question, and worked hard to resolve any potential or secondary unrelated code compliance issues. For giving this lien, we'll give Ms. Loki the uh, opportunity to start over, which she is desperate to do. Uh, we're grateful for the commission's consideration today and for the professionalism of uh, Ms. Miller, Mr. Kinney, Ms. McHale, Ms. Day, and everyone we've worked with during this process, and we thank you and are grateful for your time and consideration today. Uh, we can also answer, of course, any questions you might have. Um, thank you. Let me go ahead. Let's hear, go ahead and hear from you. So the, um, originally, since, since that October 19th um, meeting, the, gra the progress was really gradual, and, and staff was not satisfied. The secondary violations were still in place. The, um, we've been working uh, with the attorney and the applicant, and Ms. Loki, I understand that you're in a difficult position. Um, and we want to continue to work with you. I still, as a city manager, I'm not comfortable with the aesthetics on the property at this point. So I don't want to deny this application. However, I, I would ask that you table it for a period of time until we continue to work with Ms. Loki to clean, further clean up the front yard to the standard of the rest of the neighborhood. So um, I, I want to continue, as I said, understand that Ms. Loki's in a, in, in, a, in a difficult situation to acknowledge that and continue to work with you to, to clean up that front yard some more. Okay, any questions or? I, I do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'll, I'll just address them generally. Um, so we, I've just seen these pictures. I'm acquainted with this situation. And, um, and I'm curious uh, on, a, on a couple points. Number one, um, how has the neighborhood responded um, to what's out there. I'm not necessarily to speaking to you, so don't worry. You guys can go ahead and sit down. You don't have to yeah. keep at the end of there. We'll call you up if we need it. How has how the, the neighborhood uh, responded to this uh, situation? As I look at the pictures, it, those, those are pictures, and, uh, and I know the effort that's been made, and I know there's a tremendous cost um, of, of, of someone like a, a Ms. Loki here of, of having an attorney on board for these issues, and I'm just wondering... Uh, and I appreciate what you do. Trust me, you know that. Um, I'm, like I'm speaking to the uh, compliance folks, and uh, and so I'm just wondering if if we couldn't go forward with this. Um, and I understand your recommendation. You're following the rules, uh, et cetera. But that we go forward with the recommend uh, with and change the recommendation to 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 move forward without this hanging over her head. And and should it occur again. Um, it's, I, I don't want I'm no vindictive, vind, uh, vindictive activity, but so the question is, do, how, how, do, how do the other neighborhood neighbors feel about this, and, and could, could we do this and go forward? Uh, perhaps you could answer this, or who, whoever you wish. So, <clears throat> so Chelsea Miller, for the, um, for the record. So I have not received any further complaints in the neighborhood. Um, I have seen a few homes in the area that probably are in a little bit worse shape um, that technically aren't, you know, non-compliant, but, you know, yard art, that type of thing. It's very much a gray area. Um, but I haven't seen any other complaints from that area. I've seen her neighbors out a couple of times, just, you know, kind of hanging out in the yard, which I didn't before. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> So I, I would just add to that, Mr. Commissioner. So the initial complaint came in back in, looks like January of 2019. So I, I, referring to what Chelsea's uh, talking about, at this point she has not heard back from that particular complaint or anybody else through that time period. Right. <clears throat> can you make sure your microphones are on? So, so can you, may I ask just sure. over here if you can answer the second part of that? Understanding that you're following the rules and you're right. doing this the way it has to be, and then we have to make a decision on it. Right. Um, we could move forward, uh, change it, and, and, and if should it occur again, then obviously someone could make a complaint to the code compliance office and we could go back out and, and, and check on it. That's correct. Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you. If I may add? The, the, I'm sorry, Commissioner, the, the lien amnesty program is discretionary in the city commission. It's not something you have to do or something you don't have to do. This is a one-time opportunity, though, to get this property 
uh, into compliance, which I understand from the code officer is that, is that they are in compliance, but also to address the aesthetic issues within the neighborhood. Um, and to continue to work with Ms. Loki. So as a result, I'm not asking you to deny it or approve it. I'm asking you to, to table it until we can bring it back to you with a full solution and you're comfortable with, with staff's recommendation. Um, you know, I'm going to go with your recommendation. And thank you, John, and I totally understand. I think we all have real compassion. Um, she's had a really hard, difficult time. But I would rather see it all together, you know, and at least really start fresh. I mean, give, give you the time to really clean it up. It's really a fresh start. That's how I feel. I'm sorry. I missed what you said. You, which recommendation, John's or Jennifer's? Jennifer's. Gotcha. I was, I was thinking you were going the other direction. Okay. Commissioner? Yeah, I mean, I think um, when we did the lean amnesty program, I mean, certainly my vision, I think it was the rest of our vision is, you know, we don't want to hamper people's property when, you know, it's long past. I mean, they've taken care of these issues, and, and he, we've got these thousands and thousands of dollars lean that just doesn't seem to serve a purpose because the purpose is about compliance. Um, I, I think it's, this isn't what I envisioned, to have a property that just slides in under the radar and gets it maybe to the minimum cleaned up. Uh, it still doesn't hit my standard, um, but again, you know, it's a community standard. Um, you know, I, I'll say it again. I mean, code is is about health, safety, welfare. It's about fairness to neighborhoods, you know, quality of life of neighborhoods. And uh, I think, um, I don't, I don't want to belittle this in any way, but uh, by using this comparison, but when you're doing performance appraisals for employees, I've learned for many, many years, I learned the hard way, you don't give them the great score hoping they're going to change. You, and, you know, you say, hey, you need to change, and then I'm going to give you the great score. And I think this is it. I mean, I think this is just that we, you know, we need to see this be compliant consistently. And I think that's what lean amnesty is about. Then when it is, then, then we basically say we forgive this. This doesn't, this doesn't serve a purpose anymore because we're about compliance. But number one, we're about fairness to neighbors. And I think that it's not where I feel it should be. And um, I don't want to give a forgiveness on something that I don't think has achieved a goal. So I support the city manager's recommendation. Commissioner? Uh, Vice Mayor? Sorry. For the last meeting. I know. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I should have worn a hat or something. Uh, I'm very, uh, thank you uh, to the city manager for her recommendation. I was struggling going into this. I think maybe we all were, because um, uh, to, to John's point, um, and, and also to Commissioner uh, Freeney's that uh, it, it's about the, the neighborhood and respecting the neighborhood and, and fairness. Um, this isn't about penalizing any, anybody, um, but just looking at the history, understanding that the homeowner has been struggling, um, really felt guilty with either action I was going to take. Um, so the fact that we're just tabling it, uh, to me, is the right resolution, solution at this point to continue working with the homeowner and making sure that we get to a point where that point is sustainable. And, and right now it looks like they're still on a slope. And so if we just get into that point of sustainability, that's, that's where I'd be much happier to, to go with the recommendation here. But until then, the tabling is, is where I'm leaning. Uh, I agree. Um, we, as Commissioner Franey mentioned, we created this program for uh, a reason. And so I want to make sure that when we use it, that it is um, done so um, evenly and fairly across the board. And if we do it here, we have to be willing to do it somewhere else. And I'm not sure that was the purpose of it. Um, we're certainly not trying to make any money here, but the, the lien is a tool to urge compliance. And that's everything that we have, all the changes we've made in code compliance have been geared towards pushing for compliance and not making money. And if we give up our tool that we have here to achieve appliance, we have no leverage. And then we have to start all over again. And I don't think the neighborhood deserves that. Nor I also believe that we, we're already in it now. We might as well finish it. I don't want to see us have to go back to this and start all over again. Um, so, you know, just for those reasons, 
I think it's important. So, Mayor, if I may, one of the things I'd like to do actually is reach out to some of the community organizations yeah. that we've been working with to see if they could help Ms. Loki, acknowledging her attorney is, has time constraints and Ms. Loki has physical constraints as well. So, uh, and we have lots of excellent community organizations, as, as you know. So we'll see if we can get some help there too. And I mean, when you look at the pictures and the dates on the pictures, I mean, it's definitely improved. I, I, I certainly don't want to, you know, yes. <laughs> there definitely is an improvement. Yeah, I um, drove by there yesterday and I could say, it. Oh, okay, well, getting better. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> you know, in, in the past, sometimes the Rotary Clubs have taken on, um, you know, different projects and they've gotten all their members together and went out and helped. You know, on a particular project, I remember going out, weeding, painting a particular home a long mm -hmm. time ago. So, and I know we have other faith-based uh, organizations that might be interested in doing it as a project. Yes. So, I think that's an excellent idea mm -hmm. to get them help. Mm -hmm. Even the high school. Right. Mm -hmm. Volunteer hours mm -hmm. for Bright Futures. That's true. You know, and I mean, we've talked about that a lot during the course of all the changes we made in code compliance that um, you know we want to try to bring people together to help which also helps the neighborhood so yeah no it's a key you know there's a property not too far from where I am that was just really bad and one of the faith-based groups came in it was an older lady she just couldn't get out of the hole and they got her out of the hole and now she's keeping it great I mean, so that is a key. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a real key. Mayor, before you take your vote sure. and before people start moving about the cabin, I just want to thank Ch Chelsea Miller for all the really hard work she's doing. She is our only code enforcement officer, as you know. Co -co I know. Officer. I saw the. Oh, my gosh. So she is working really, really hard, and uh, she's uh, demonstrating a lot of patience. Um, and um, I appreciate the, the patience of the public as well as we work through this. But well done, Chelsea. You're doing a super job, and I want to acknowledge that in front of the five of you. Thank you, Chelsea. So as a point of order, I sure. haven't gotten to comments yet. Oh, sorry. To me. Oh, I'm so. sorry. I thought you made your comments. No, I asked questions before. Oh. So um, as far as I understand what's been presented here is they are technically compliant with this. Okay? And, and as I said before, we can find other, well, as you mentioned and what was discussed up here, we can find people perhaps to help. Uh, perhaps she has an inclination to have her property sort of the way it is. Maybe it's a, it is a unique look. Um, but, but if it's compliant, um, then I appreciate, and, and, I'll, and I, I'll vote how I wish to vote, but it is a difficult vote, as, as Jeff said. It's, a, it's something that we wish were a little bit better, but, but it's compliant. And so not in, for, for the, for the uh, individual here, um, she is encumbered, so to speak, with this still hanging over her head and, uh, and with an attorney. Uh, now, I don't know if she would need to have that attorney as we continue, and therefore then it adds another question. What, when would this then be brought back up again? Is this table time, date certain or is this table indefinitely? And, and again, it, it, is, it is our right to make that decision if we wished, especially if it is in compliance, certainly. And so uh, I just wanted to make sure I stated that because we have people up here that just made a comment that making us to believe that we're not compliant. She is compliant. It was stated that she's compliant. So my, my position is as I just stated. Mm -hmm. um, she's compliant and I believe that, uh, and I appreciate what staff is doing here totally um, so I'm not going against staff I'm just suggesting that we take the next step and uh, and, and provide her that that le not leniency uh, again my question is always what about the rest of the neighbors and where are they on this and how do they feel about this so I don't know how they feel um, and I am concerned about that but again we have code compliance requirements and if they're not well then here we go again I hope that would never happen but but the statement was technically she is in compliance. So tabling is just that. It means there is no date certain. It gives you all a particular time frame to right. work with her. And um, so I assume you've got a, a time frame in your mind. I do, her. yes. I guess in 30 days or something. You've mobilized, yes, I do. And Mayor, I want to apologize for going out of order to the commissioner. No, no, I didn't no, mean no. to step on your toes. No, you, you weren't at all. Okay. 
Uh oh. I guess we was were. Was it me? <laughs> well, I mean, I well, so, no. To be honest, I mean, there there was a question, but there were a lot of comments in what you said. So I thought you had your comments in there. So my apologies if I no, if I skipped you. We're all good. <laughs> well, everybody's good. I think compliance is gray at best. Well, yeah. it, just to say that, John, with due respect to you. Well, compliance then, is great. With due respect to you, I have people over here that are telling me that technically they're in compliance. We also use the word gray. Hmm? Also use the word gray. You may. This came sliding in at the last so, minute. So it doesn't have to be in due respect to me. It's, you can just make the statement. It's all good. It's all good. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. To table this item. To table this item. Um, Did we put a motion? Uh, no, we didn't actually. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Can I have a motion so to table? If, if I may, moved. If, if I may, if you table it, it table on date certain or no, it's not an advertised ordinance, so that doesn't okay. have any significance. There is no date certain for table. Give, give Only that. if there's an advertisement associated. Then, to your point, commissioner, the city saves on advertising costs when you do that. But there's not an advertisement associated with this application. I've never been concerned about the advertising. I've only been concerned about the person who's getting the Well, that's, table. that's, I think that the, the, the impression that I get is that the lines of communication are instructed to remain Thank open you. and moving forward positively. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Franey. If I have a second. I'll second. <clears throat> I'll second. Okay, second to table. Uh, roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Gow? Aye. Commissioner Tornga? Nay. Commissioner Kynes? Aye. Commissioner Franey? Aye. Mayor Wojcicki? Aye. That motion passes four to one. Thank you. Okay, uh, move on to action items, which is resolution 2132, fiscal 2021 final budget amendment. Um, Nikki, would you please read that resolution by title only? Yes, Mayor. Resolution number 21 32 this time. A resolution of the City Commission of the City of Dunedin, Florida, amending the city's operating and capital budgets for fiscal year beginning October 1, 2020, and ending September 30th, 2021, and providing for an effective date. This has been reading of resolution 21 32 by title only. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Gow. Liz, Ashley. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, Les Tyler, the Finance Director, and I'm here with Ashley Kempton, our Budget Manager. And uh, this item is Resolution 2132, as mentioned. Uh, this is our last budget amendment for fiscal year 21. Uh, Florida Statute 166.241 provides that uh, cities can amend our, amend our budget any time during the year or 60 days following the year end of, that, of the fiscal year. The proposed amendments in the staffing today are on pages 3 through 8 in the staffing report and also listed in, in attachment B of the staffing report. The total impact of all funds uh, in this budget amendment is $3,748,000. And I'd like to briefly go over the amendments. Some of these have been mentioned a little bit in the CRA, but uh, please walk through the key ones. The first, I'll start with the general fund amendments. Uh, the first one is uh, we, and we had this in quite a few funds uh, uh, in the staffing report today. But there's an increase in expenses of $148,934 in fiscal year 21 for a 2% salary adjustment uh, for general non-union employees. Uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic required staff to make budget cuts in 2021 uh, during the process of developing the budget. One of the items that was cut in the 21 budget was merit increases. And during, tw during the turn of 21 mid-year update, it was determined that an increase in wages was affordable and commission directed staff to provide a 2% salary adjustment. Uh, as I mentioned, this same adjustment is in, is in quite a few funds uh, throughout the uh, amendment today, that I, but I will I'll cover that once so we don't go over it every time. The next amendment is the, in the general fund is an $80,000 adjustment for COVID-19 expenses that we incurred in 2021. Uh, that is for materials and con uh, contracts resulting in a decrease in fund balance. I want to mention that staff uh, Staff requested through the CARES Act grant through the county, we, we requested reimbursement of these costs from the period October 2020 of December 20, uh, uh, to December 2020, and we, and we received uh, the co those costs during that time frame. The remainder of the costs, which are about $39,000 uh, of this amount, uh, has been submitted on a FEMA grant. We submitted a FEMA grant a month ago uh, for FEMA-related reimbursements related to COVID for $39,000. So we expect this full amount to be reimbursed uh, through that FEMA grant. 
The last amendment in the general fund is an increase in expenses of $7,200, and this is for design costs associated with a, furniture, a future repair and upgrade to the library planner, uh, formerly a fountain, and the surrounding area. Uh, construction will be brought forward to the commission for approval at a later date, and this project will be funded through the P. Jackson Estate Bequest, a restricted funding source for the general fund, and it has no impact on the available fund balance. Now, moving to the penny fund, uh, we have a couple of adjustments in the penny fund. The first is uh, we have a, an increase in revenue budget of $4.5 million, and that's uh, recognizing in the budget the contributions received from the Pinellas Community Foundation to assist with the funding of the purchase of the Gladys Douglas property. And the second part of this is we have an increase in expenditures of $6.5 million for the purchase of the Gladys Douglas property, which is the portion that the city paid. And this item was presented to the commission on February 23rd, 2021, uh, which was part of the, was the agreement to purchase and sell between Highland Memorial Gardens and the city of Dunedin for the 44 acres uh, located at 1900 Virginia Avenue. So the net, the net of this is a net decrease in fund balance of $2 million, just over $2 million. The last item in the penny fund is uh, we have a decrease in, in the revenue budget by $3.8 eight million dollars to reverse the fiscal year 2021, 2021 interfund transfer from the water wastewater fund to the penny fund and this transfer was in our 21 budget uh, and in the 21 budget we planned on paying for the, the plan was for the utility fund to pay for all of the cost of city hall up front and uh, and since that time uh, there's been a change in that uh, the, the, the city had a utility rate study done about a year ago and through that study, it was determined that it uh, made more sense for the uh, utility fund to finance their portion of the, of the uh, city hall. So basically, we're, we're, we're unwinding here that original allocation for, uh, for it being an upfront payment. So now the, now the utility fund will make annual payments, annual transfers to the penny fund starting in fiscal year 22 through fiscal year 30, to pay their share of the city hall cost. And the next fund is the water wastewater fund. Uh, the first is the, uh, the, there's a decrease in expenses in the amount of $3.8 million to reverse the transfer that I just discussed, and this is just the other side of the entry in the penny fund uh, for the $3.8 million. The next item uh, is re revolve regarding the state revolving loan fund. Uh, we, we have expenses of $753,000 uh, in, the, in the water sewer fund. And this, this has to do with a, a loan service fee and capitalized interest that is charged on SRF loans. The SRF loan agreements have a service fee of 2% of the loan amount, of, of the outstanding principal loan amount at, at any point in time. And this is as of September 30th, 2021 is the cutoff here. Uh, and also this capitalized interest that's accrued and compounds from the time the disbursements are made and are made until the, the initial loan payment and the first payment is, is due. And our first payment due by, due is due by November 20, November 2022 is our first payment. And the capitalized interest will, be, will start being paid when we make our first payment beginning at, at that time. Uh, the service fee is $229,000 and the capitalized interest is $524,000. And the next is the risk fund. Uh, the risk fund has an increase in expenses uh, over our budget of $300,000. Um, the city had some unforeseen liability settlements and related attorney costs in 2021, defending, claim, defending claims in, of about $240,000. Uh, so uh, we knew the fund was trending over throughout the year, but uh, it, the, uh, we, waited, we knew it was gonna be over, but it was a little more than we expected, but we're doing the adjustment of 300,000 to make sure we're covered. And that is a decrease in that position in the risk fund. The next is a health fund. Um, we have an increase in the expenses in the health fund of $220,000. Uh, this is an increase in medical, medical claim cost. Our medical claim cost were more than budget in 2021. We had the highest number of claims that went to stop loss in the past eight years in 2021. Uh, and the stop loss amount is I think 110,000. So uh, it was a, a fairly, fairly expensive year in the, in the health fund. So, this decreases the net position in that fund by $220,000. And the other, the, other, the other budget adjustments are all related to the 2% salary adjustment I mentioned earlier. And I want to just reference quickly attachment C, which shows the uh, estimated ending available fund balance for each, uh, each of the funds. 
and it shows the beginning amount of fund balance, and then it shows the actual, our best estimates of the actuals for 2021. We still have our audit to come, and we're still doing some final year end adjustments, but these are, are pretty, pretty close to where we think they'll end up. Uh, all the funds meet or exceed the reserve targets, uh, with the exception of the health fund. Uh, the health fund is, uh, is under, under, the health fund's at 11.4% of, of, of expenditures, operating expenditures. It's under the goal. Our goal was about $609,000, and we're under the goal by $147,000. So, uh, and that's, that's, that number is shown in red font uh, in attachment C. And this is due, again, mainly to the increased claim cost in 2021 mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a couple of ways to address uh, bless you. Uh, our, our difference. Here. Bless you. Address our difference. Uh, one, is, one is to transfer dollars uh, from the risk fund, which, which that's one thing we'll consider, uh, which we've done uh, some in the past. And another is to do an allocation to all departments and funds for health care costs. And the plan is uh, finance will be working with with uh, uh, Teresa and the, and the risk department and, and determine, uh, and Jennifer, and determine what we think is the best, me best method, uh, and we'll bring that forward to the commission at some, some point in the near future. Uh, that concludes our comments. Any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, questions for uh, Les? I just, go ahead. <clears throat> well, my only question is, there's nothing in here that we haven't seen or approved before. That's correct. Um, I was just wondering, with our claims, were any of those extraordinary claims due to the underlying cause of COVID? I actually asked uh, Teresa that, and she said no. Okay, because I was wondering then if, mm. you know. Okay, thank you. Sheer stress? Definitely. <laughs> well, definitely. Betcha that's a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Commissioner? Thank you. Are there any specific... Uh, Les, are there any specific requirements for that fund that are different with relationship to the reserve? Are there any specific requirements? Yeah, that's a good question. There, there, is, there are some unique requirements for that fund. There's a, there's a requirement that we, we attest that at the end of every year that we are at this 60, we are at this 60 uh, or 60 day reserve uh, amount. And we're under that now. So, so uh, because of that, uh, we we are required to write a letter to the uh, to the state and just basically say we're under, but we but but let them know we have means to fix it or, or adjust it. So, and so, but, but so there are requirements. There's a, there's a requirement that every year we do a we we do a look working with our actuary that we that we do have about a 60 day reserve or more. And and, and we're close. We're, the dollar amount's not huge, but we but we do we want to shore it up in the near future, and we'll. We'll come back with what we think makes the most sense uh, to, to do that, whether it's the risk fund, if there's, if there's money there, or, or just do another allocation to the departments that receive help. Right now, it looks like it would be the risk fund, that we're yeah, over in our reserve like in the risk plenty. fund. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> anyone wishing to come forward and speak to this item? Seeing or hearing none, any final comments from anybody? Um, Rebecca Volkova. Commissioner Torenga. Aye. Commissioner Kynes. Aye. Vice Mayor Gao. Aye. Commissioner Franey. Aye. Mayor Brzezowski. Aye, and that motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, Les. Thank you, Ashley. All right, we are um, at the awarding of the bid for our pavement management and milling um, annual contract for city streets. Um, Bruce. Bruce Good morning. Good morning, Bruce. Bruce Worth, uh, Public Works, Engineering. The uh, item before you is, as you indicated, it's the award of our annual pavement contract. Uh, in, in this particular uh, agreement, we are looking at all the streets that you, you have in this contract are proposed for milling and paving. There are some additional gutter work, sidewalk, uh, no sidewalk, gutter work that's associated with it. Uh, the low bid was the uh, Preferred Materials, Inc., uh, company out of Tampa. And so we're asking you to approve the award. Uh, if, if you do so, we will go forward. We expect that the agreement will be returned to us this month. Pre-construction would, meeting would begin in January. Uh, hopefully, 
the work will begin in March, in that February, March timeframe and be completed by June. Any questions? Any chance you can put the map up so people can see it? I don't. Probably not available. Okay, any questions for Bruce? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. Don't go here, please. No, I just, um, to that, to that uh, statement you made about the map, is that something that's up on the uh, website? So, like, if you're in, so people what can look and say, hey, my. I, I don't know if, if what you have in front of you is on the website. Okay. Uh, it was an attachment to the, to the package. Sure. But what we are doing now is that once we meet with the contractor and get a schedule as to when they're going to do the streets, the, the map is, uh, will be on the website. And then we also, once we have the schedule, we'll post it as, a, as an active project indicating what streets uh, are within the program. And then, of course, when the contractor actually does the work, they're required to notice the, uh, the impacted uh, residences along those streets uh, at least 48 hours in advance and let them know that the, uh, the work's being done. And while Paul's pulling this up, again, a reminder, so what drives these streets is the Agile Asset Software Program. So every, every year, you know, we continually look at the program, and it tells us the streets that require the various levels of, of pavement protection. Everything from the rejuvenation, which is just we typically do on the new streets. You'll see that happen in the next couple of months also, where the streets we did last year, we come back and we put that rejuvenating agent on there as a protection type of a material. And then the software tells us, uh, what streets need to be addressed and to what level. And the majority of that work is the milling and paving. That's, that's really where you're, 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 you're getting the most bang for your buck at that point. Mill, you remove the asphalt, put the asphalt down. If it gets past that stage, then you're into the more expensive reconstruction. Kind of like what we did on San Salvador. You have to tear the whole road up, the base, and, and that's about three times the cost of the milling and paving. So we target that. Again, the idea with the program is if you, if you stay within that milling and paving range, you can hold steady your, your, your overall streets. Uh, and then, if, if, again, if you let it go past that, then it's going to cost more. And, and then, of course, you're, you're limited by your budget. Um, my other question is, I mean, do we get a lot of issues we, uh, in Paul? I know Paul knows about this. The, um, I'm assuming you both do. Um, I think it was Lake Paloma. We had uh, some issues where drainage, where it, doesn't proper, it wasn't done properly, the overlay. Number one, I'm assuming that's been corrected for the homeowner. And number two, is that an issue we have a lot? Yes, yes, and yes. We, we have addressed the issue um, of, of the street. And, and it, that's a good point. So. Here's some of the things that we're, we're running into now that we've really gotten into, really got this program up and humming. Let, let's take those streets, Planoma and, and several other in that neighborhood. If you go down there, you'll notice something. There's no gutters. There used to be gutters. Somewhere underneath that asphalt, existing asphalt, we see what's, what, what is left of the gutter, the curb. And so what's happened over time is that those, those gutters have been overpaved, they shouldn't have been, um, but it affects the flow line of that. And so what happened on Planoma, if you, you picture this, they had nothing really to, to gauge it on as they went, as they went down that street. You, you've got those granite um, curbs sticking up, so when they went in there and, and they shaved off the, the, the inch and a half of, of asphalt and then came back in and put that inch and a half back on, um, it, keep in mind they do this with big big machines and guys. We were off. We went down there and shot that, that particular one where we had one of the problems where the water was stacking up in the drive. We were off a half an inch, um, about a, a, a house down. So what happened is when that little bit of overpave came in, all of a sudden it created a flow line and that half inch went back and is water sink. So that, that's a problem. And uh, we're looking at that, and quite honestly, we took some streets off of this contract because we didn't have gutters to go by. Um, it could get very expensive if we go back in and recreate those gutters, and that's something we're talking about, because uh, the program really isn't set up, it wasn't set up to necessarily rebuild the storm drain system. It was really set up to go in and just lift the asphalt off and put it back on. So we're thinking about that. So that's one of the things we have to look at in those. There might be some other 
options that we can do um, in terms of maintaining the flow line, um, but it, it is something we're looking at. What, what we try to do, what, what I've done uh, since I've been doing this is, uh, again, I've said this before, I'm the guy that rides around in the rain. So when I know the street's coming, I've tried to go out and, and in the rain in the summer um, and, and look at those particular streets and are they holding water. Uh, in a couple of cases, we found that, and that's why we're redoing some of the gutter. Um, it's, it's just out of shape. So it's, it's getting a little more complicated um, than typical. The easy stuff is the good gutters, mill and pave and go, and that's what we're doing. The other stuff we really have to sit down, and Paul and, and, and Russell and I have been talking about it, on how are we going to address some of these streets where we don't have uh, gutters, we don't have a flow line. If you go out and get survey to figure that out, that also is very expensive. But we're putting our arms around it, and, and we're trying to deal with it. Okay. Thank you. And I also see that we'll be talking about brick streets December 14th, so I won't yes, even Yes, we're going to bring back that and, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that, that, that part of this and, and uh, an important piece. So we're hoping to get some direction on that and uh, we'll circle back around. Great. Thank you. Bruce. Yes, I was very happy we're going to talk about brick streets also. Um, but what you're basically saying is some of these streets are so old that you have to almost do a complete restoration because of the gutters. The gutters, you don't have those mark markers anymore. I mean, they've deteriorated. Uh, you're saying the good roads, you just put the asphalt and put the, the top coat on, but where, where they've eroded the gutters, it's almost a restoration. It, it is to the sense of even those, those roads where there's no gutter, typically the asphalt is and the base is okay. So that would be, that, that's the mill and pay. What, what gets, what we have to look at, and again, we did, we've done a couple of these. San Salvador is an example where we took all the gutter out because it was just, was, it had moved and all of that. I want to say that was about a 1,300 foot stretch of road, cost us $95,000 for gutter work. So, but to your point, yes, yeah, so if we went into one of these roads, well, let's say the road's okay, we need a gutter, we, gotta, we go in and we have to, you know, cut that piece out, have them put the gutter in first, all the driveway aprons, get affected, and then once we get the gutter in place, we then can come back in and mill and pave. So uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's something we need to think about. And, and quite honestly, the, when you adopted this program and you were presented with the Agile Asset model and sort of showed how it worked, it, wasn't, it didn't really expect that you were going to invest that much into your gutters and under drains is another issue we, on several of the streets. So it's something we're going to be pulling together this winter. Uh, this is kind of, we, we're, we're in good shape now. We're getting the, con the, the fiscal year contract out now at the beginning. We'll get the paving done. And so we've got a little bit of time and we're putting our heads together and uh, going to, we'll come back with that and, and, and see how, how, if we have to adjust our budget, you know, more, more gutters and, and more under drains means less streets. We have to see how that all stacks up. So is it the gutter that causes the overflow down the street, the lack of, or is it the under drain? Well, the under drain, let's take the under drain first. The under drain is put in to keep the, the water table, if you will, from getting in under the road. Uh, and you see that all, you know, Dunedin is an interesting place because you've got neighborhoods where you've got clay layers and that water just moves down and you, you've seen it. That gets under the road and that's where you lose your road base. That, uh, that old limestone d degrades and then the road really disintegrates on you and that's the more expensive reconstruction. So you'd like to do that in as many places as possible. The, the gutters um, lack of or if they're not in right, it, it, it typically is, is backing up water. If it's too low, it just means it's running to the inlet if we have an inlet. If not, we then, again, we get the flow line wrong or in a lot of cases what you'll see when we go out and many here, we'll go out and look at a, got a good gutter except there's a section that's gone. If it's broken up, that's easy. We have a couple where there's big trees have pushed the gutter up an inch, two, and all of a sudden all that, that flow line pushes all that water back up the street. So we try to fix all those things. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I understand water getting underneath can play a, a, a major role in the health or the longevity of the road. Um, what impact does uh, car trips play in, in the wear and tear, I guess, of the road? I don't think it's, volume obviously wears out a road. Uh, you know, regardless, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing, and this comes back to some of the brick uh, discussion, is I don't think it's the, the it's not necessarily the volume of, of of traffic; it's the weight of traffic. You know, when we were looking at the streets, uh, the brick streets throughout, particularly those what we're going to talk about next time down there along the the uh, the coast a little bit where the soils aren't as good. We, you know, we sit here and say this 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 is a fifty. You know, brick streets can last you. Sit, Hundred years, you really can. Uh, so, what's happened in in the last couple of decades? Why these streets all of a sudden are are failing more rapidly than previous? And in our opinion, is you've got heavier. You know, a lot of construction has been on these streets with just cranes and cement trucks and and and, and garbage trucks are going. We're seeing on a lot of the streets when we go down it, it's 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 that right rear side is is worn next to the gutter. Well, that's the weight of that combination of the weight of that, that heavy uh, you know, vehicle. And if there's a little bit of water table, it makes it a little softer. So yes, anytime you have wear, I mean, more often, to your point, 19 or, or 580 will get resurfaced more often than another street just based on cars going over it. Yes, it does wear it. So that's, that's your life cycle of the road. But I think the bigger issue is uh, some of the heavier equipment and things that, that are occurring. Uh, so we're seeing some of that, again, in neighborhoods where you're seeing a lot of redevelopment. And all of a sudden, we're going, what happened to this road? And it's because, you know, it's just heavy equipment has been going up and down it. And uh, that, that's part of it. Okay. So aside from the construction vehicles, right, if you have the same number of, of trips or volume of trips, whether those trips are in cars or residential trucks or golf carts or bicycles, would you see a difference yeah, in I, the wear and tear of the Again, you know, number of trips, weight of vehicle obviously has less. It, it's just a, a physics kind of thing. You know, you've got, you've got a 4,000-pound you know, <clears throat> vehicle versus a golf cart. And uh, it, it, if that's all you ran on it, you, you, you know, golf cart, you'd, you'd obviously get a significant greater life cycle. Uh, so yes, w you know, volume does play a, 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 a big role, and then the, the, the type of, of vehicle also plays a big role. Okay. And, and I, I know that residential development or redevelopment can ebb and flow depending on the economy, but um, his historically, what does the city spend annually on, on repaving of roads? You have, you have a million dollar, well, at least since I'm aware, uh, since you've kind of, I think, set the program that you have in place now. Right now, you're allocating a million dollars annually. Um, you're, you're getting about 310000 from the penny, the gas tax, six ninety from the penny. So we've been working with a million dollars uh, annually since 2017, I believe. Okay. And so right now, you know, it looks like we're, we're holding the line. You know, but as goods and services begin to creep up, we'll keep an eye on that to see if that's a, you know, that's a sustainable number. Again, what you want to do is just not let your streets, you know, deteriorate beyond that, that, uh, that mill and pave point. And, and that software helps you do that? It does. It does. And we go out and we readjust that software. And as I've said before, the software tells us where to go. We visually look at it. And then again, we fill in the gaps. Uh, and one last thing to your point. Uh, you know, we typically go in a standard mill and pave is an inch and a half off, an inch and a half back on. We've gone to several roads with high traffic. New York is, is one of the roads on this um, area, and there's a couple out in, in Fairway Villages where it, it's, I don't know if it's, New York is a high traffic, um, high volume weight type of road, but we're putting addition, we, we have some options. We, we went to two inch milling and paving just to, to stabilize that road. That's an option that you can go in when you have those high volume, high weight roads. You can put a little extra uh, stiffness into the road. That helps. Thank you very much. Good. Commissioner? Hey, thank you. 
So, uh, Bruce, as you know, I'm very interested in this, and I had a long conversation with the city manager about this subject, um, and, and going back in a number of years of how much we spent, and she and we, we discussed that. And it, some of that came from when I looked at the number. Again, I'm familiar with the number. I went back and looked at the budget and saw where we were. Um, but, but I was given the update about how much we have spent over the last six, six years in this. And it, it, it came to my attention because as I was looking at this map, um, I, I went down into the detail and I saw actually how few streets this really is. So uh, that's, maybe that's, that's okay. I'm just saying I, I went and looked at them and identified them. And so I've got a series of questions. I'm just going to ask a bunch of them and, and let you see if you want to touch on any of them. Um, we used to talk about level of service. How, how do you, would you remind us how these, how these streets get ranked? Um, it is important, the ranking of the street, because that, that, that does affect insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Would you also talk about how many of these streets that we have, and this is a wild estimate, I'm sure, or maybe it's exacting, how many of these can be milled and paved that, we, that, we, that exist uh, today? And roughly how many of them may require much more work than that? Um, if, you could, if you could just touch on that, because I talk about that somewhat frequently. Let's start at, at the beginning. So the, the software program, uh, so what we did is we, we, we inventoried or we, we, we created a, a citywide map of all the streets and um, what the surface was. So you, you wind up, I, I want it off the top of my head, I, I want to say we have 110 or 15 um, miles of streets of which 8,000 or 6, I wish I had known, I have the number, they bounce around. Somewhere about that, that, that six or eight miles of, of brick. So the rest is asphalt. Um, the the so Agile As Asset Consultant um, went in and they drove every one of the streets. And they visually rank the street conditions based on visually seeing the street. Uh, it just and that was done back in 2016, and, and um, they, they, it's gotten a little better now. They have they have trucks that go down and do that, and, and they do that by again you know looking at the the, the cracks and the and, and the source. so. Bottom line is they, they inventory it, and that's your starting point. There's five categories, if you will. There's sort of the do nothing. It's a great street. The very first thing uh, that you, so so they really don't need to do anything there. The, the next step is there's minor cracking going on, and you can go in and you do what they call a microsurface, where you put a very thin type of a layer down, or you, you crack seal it with a, a, a material, and you, and you can kind of follow the cracks, that's, that's type of thing. We did that over on Bass, if anyone, you know, about two years ago, we did a microsurface. So that's kind of your, that, that, every time you do one of these things, you're, you're, you're adding, you're, you're bringing the, the, the pavement back to, uh, you never really get it to 100, uh, obviously, but uh, you, you bring it back a little bit. So if you can make an investment, uh, let's just start with this, uh, not too much at you, but the, the mill and pave cost is about, right now we're getting cost about $16 a square yard. But if we went in and did micro seal or, cr or the crack seal, you might be getting something in the neighborhood of a five or $6 um, a, a square yard. So you're, the idea there is you make your investment there, and then you gain, in some cases, anywhere from, you know, three to five years additional life to that section that you work off. So again, we start with a very minor crack, uh, crack seal microsurface. The next big one, and that's the majority of your streets, is the mill and pave. And I would say that that probably represents. Uh, I'll get you the numbers, but I, I would say that represents at least 90% of your streets. That's kind of the good news, is that you really, the vast majority of, of your streets can be addressed through milling and paving. Then you drop down into um, sort of the reconstruction, and the first category there is something they call full depth reclamation, where they can come in with a machine, they virtually, we did this on San Salvador, Baywood area, they come down with a machine and they, depending on how much you have to do, they just, they just grind everything in its path. The asphalt, the, the base, the whole thing. They, they it, in effect, recreate the base, uh, and then you, you, you're back to asphalt. That's about $45 a square yard. 
And then if you have to go to full reconstruction where you're pulling the, the base material out, it's, it's too much for the, the FDR doesn't work. And we're doing, we haven't done many of those that I'm aware of, but FDR usually gets us there. Um, then, then you're talking about something that it's anywhere north of $45 a square yard. Um, a, lot, a lot of times what that involved, uh, St. Catharines was part of one. Where we just had uh, a big area of, of peat, and we had to dig down close to eight feet over a, a fairly large area just to get that material out. There was just no way uh, we could do that. So that, that's the, the, the last category. So what the program tells us is it tells us all of these things based on your observation back in 2016. And I mean, again, so what needs to be done here coming up is we're going to have to go back out and re-inventory the streets. Um, I, we prefer to have the, the consultant do that because they're, they're expert in this area. We, we do, we can, we see something that's really bad. Uh, for I'll get back to this. So when we see something that's bad, we will add to it. But so that's the progression of, of how this, this works. So every year, what the program does is it says that we start in 16. Every year it adds a, a sort of a, it moves it down, as you can imagine, based on algorithms that these companies have figured out that they say, if you just leave it alone, it, it, it should fail or drop into the next level. So that's what drives the selection of the streets. And that's why you see sort of this, uh, you know, if you, if you just let the program go, you'd see little bitty dots all over the place. And that's inefficient. So uh, because that mill and pay, they have to pick up and do 200 feet and then skip and, you know, they, so it's all. So we, we, we do look at it, of course, and then we kind of fill in. In some cases, we just find one or two that are sitting out there. We may leave it for the next the next one, so we try to get a little efficient. We'll do a whole subdivision, even though the program says some of those streets have another two or three years. So that's, that's what drives it. And, and again, the target pavement uh, repair is mill and pave. Don't let it get past that, and you're going to save yourself a lot of money. So that's, that's the bottom line. So that's what we target to get out in front of it. Uh, the company will tell you that you know, once you get past mill and pave, unless it becomes a public safety issue where the road's really coming up in their chunks, just let it go. It's not going to get any worse um, in a year or two or three. And we don't have many of the FDR ones. We looked this year, and, and the good news was there wasn't too many of those. So, and I'll, I'll, get, you, I'll get you some numbers um, that may share with everybody. Uh, good news, maybe when we do the brick streets is, is a good time to do that. And that reminded me. So I'm going to tell you next month when we look at the particular one, we're going to talk about Santa Barbara. Uh, just, and, and this kind of plays into how this program works. It's not infallible. You have to, you have to look at things. Uh, that section of Santa Barbara was not identified initially as one of the worst brick streets. So in 2016, it wasn't good, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't on the, it was three or four other streets that were um, in, in okay, let's greater talk need. about Brick Streets at the next meeting. Okay. Because if you bring it up now, somebody's going to bring it up here right, and we'll spend another that. 15 just minutes say, talking you, about software streets tells you something, we're not we, approving we today. Out. Just saying. Got it. Oh, You're right. John, yeah. anything else? I'm sorry. Thank, thank you. I, know that gets thank things excited. I think she shut us down. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. so no, that, Bruce how, is so thorough. I mean, you know, it's great stuff. But I did have a couple questions for you, unfortunately. I, I didn't walk in here with them, but now I have them that I've been hearing. Well, so, brick streets, right? no, <laughs> no, it's about the gutter issue. So, it's really more of a technical thing. Gutters cannot be covered by stormwater. We, we've had that discussion. So, I would only assume the gutter is covered by stormwater. I mean, really, but you don't have to answer it right now. But. We've taken the stance many, many, many years that stormwater is extremely important to our community and quality, the quality of that stormwater. And, you know, we're a well over 100-year city, and we have a lot of streets that don't have gutters. I don't want to see us put that off. I really don't. If that cost can be covered by stormwater, then that's where it needs. That should be a part of our stormwater master plan. I don't want to hear us not doing streets because we don't want to deal with the gutter. I know y'all are going to talk about it. I just wanted to put my humble opinion 
I think every street should have gutter and drain. Um, I'm highly unhappy that Michigan, St. Chris, part of St. Chris, and Pinehurst don't have gutter. And we purposely took all of that out because of cost. I think we're past that now. So, you know, I, I think all streets should have gutter and drainage. And so I just wanted to put that part of it out. Um, and hopefully that's a cost under stormwater. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say, it's not even a question. It's, it really is how exciting it is to see the program work. And the fact that there was a time four years ago, five years ago, that we were spending less than $500,000 a year on street repaving. I mean, we always talk about our basic job here is infrastructure. That's the basic function. And so those are the kinds of things you shouldn't be pinching pennies over doing it efficiently and effectively, of course. Um, but the fact that we doubled our budget for street paving shows our commitment um, to having quality neighborhoods. So again, I, I like to point that out every single year because I remember when it went from 600 to like 450,000 a year, I thought it was gonna blow a gasket because how can you do that with all the streets that we have? So anyway, thank you very much. Mayor, we're very happy that you're excited about pavement. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's an investment into our infrastructure, and, and we're not, you know, I know Dunedin's a fun city and we invest in a lot of different things, but I think it's really important to say that, you know, the base of what we're here to do, we're doing it, and that's what I'm excited about. Um, anybody from the community, uh, chambers wish to come speak to this item? Okay. Um, you have to wake them back up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I need a um, motion to approve the bid for one million one hundred thousand three one hundred thirty thousand one hundred twenty-two dollars and seventy cents for. So moved. Second. Commissioner Freining, Commissioner Collins. Any final comments from anybody? Okay. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Bruce, you gave us an education this morning, my friend. <laughs> Great. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have the review and approval of our 2022 calendar, which Jennifer and friends uh -huh. worked on. I think we have a copy of it. Um, I understand there might be some questions about it. Um, basically, the initial idea was get it away from some of the holidays move around the dates, especially the ones that, you know, Friday, Monday situation where Monday's a holiday and Friday, which is usually when agenda review and, and then doing the July, August thing that we typically do. And we did talk at the last meeting that that time frame will transition every year. Yes. We don't have to reapprove that every year. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. And we also, Mary, added the Blue Jays. The right. right. Okay. The Toronto thing. Yeah. Right. Okay, so questions, concerns? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, obviously I was one that said, hey, we should look at the holidays, but when I looked at it, my only fear was I just felt like, wow, we just threw all the meetings up in the air, and now, you know, the whole first week, third week is kind of nowhere. You know what I mean? It's like they're, I mean, almost half the months aren't first and third. So I just, I think it makes it tough for our citizens to get in a rhythm of when is it and and i um i have some suggested changes um that maybe get us closer back to that but um i was just concerned about that we kind of had a rhythm and then um I, I just think it kind of throws that off um for me personally as well a couple of the changes that happened you know i i do my calendar based on first and third weeks because that's what we do it's only three months that that out of the year July. Yeah, actually, January's off, March January, is off. January, March, and July. Uh, June's off, July's off. June's uh, not off. December's off. June's not off. Yeah, not June. according to our rules and regs. Yeah, normally that would be uh, May 31st and, and uh, June 2nd. But the Toronto trip. But the Toronto that trip was put, added put, to June 2nd to the 5th, so then it was pushed back. 
Yeah, I'm just saying, like, if you look at it, there's like six months that don't fall to know how we normally do it. Um, so if I, I don't know how to do it other than I can throw out a few changes that I think well, are helpful, but I, I don't know. What about July? I mean, has anybody got a problem with meeting the 7th of July? You can fix that pretty easy. Yeah, I don't have a problem Well, with you've that got either. the 5th, the day after the 4th, as a meeting. Oh, Plus, yeah. you've got, I mean, that's why we did it. It's really, the, at least in my mind, it's also making life easy on our, our staff, trying to work around this stuff. And I mean, I get it. But if we put our cal calendar out a whole year in advance. We can still make changes if we have enough time. We can still make changes. But I mean, if correct? we're putting a, a calendar yeah. out a year it's in advance mm -hmm. and it's on, our, it's on our website, I just, I mean, that's why they went back to do it. And now we've done it. And well, we, we could throw it all up in the air right now and say, because I, I had this discussion with Jennifer too that, Actually, even a better schedule would be Wednesday mornings, Thursday evenings, because it gives us all more time for staffing and the city manager. Except to get Wednesday in. mornings. Wednesday mornings, you have TDC. Everybody, I get that. A lot of people. And yeah. Forward Pinellas. And um, so that doesn't work. I yeah. mean, that would no, to be like the and dream Tuesdays, it has to be that yeah. way. Um, anyway, so if we're going to shift the calendar, I guess I just have a few things that I would request changing if we're going to get out of our first third. Weekend. Yeah, because last last year, I think it was very similar to this. Mm -hmm. No, okay. actually, I have it, and it's, no, we pretty much stuck to our first third. What's wrong with religiously. The, uh, December? I mean, to have Like, December, I think, even crowds in, like, all our meetings into two weeks versus yeah, I mean, having more separated, which makes the, the holiday of, season even crazier. The first of December, I mean, I, I don't get that. I'm not sure why December is that way. Yeah, I mean, we literally, like, I have... Why, why is December that way? I don't know. That would make more sense in December. We followed first, third week. Oh, it's because of Thanksgiving. Because of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Because Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. because yeah. Thanksgiving is later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When yeah, is no. Thanksgiving? The 20th. So we'd have to do the agenda. I mean, and we can. We're, it was just what we requested last time. So we just made, went in and made those oh, changes. Oh, the 25th, 24th, 25th. So mm -hmm. Which is what happened this year. You're saying this year didn't work, so do you want to change next year? Yeah, this year was was pretty rocky as far as getting this meeting put together for all of you, just as far, you know, given the holiday um, and that type of thing. Because really, we, we need to, to upload and get that upload in Granicus by Wednesday, which is difficult to do, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I'm just bringing it to your attention. This year, we stuck religiously to first and third week. Next year, we would be like half of it not, you know, so just it's just the routine of, of you know, the norm of you know what we try to do and what we actually have in our policies, as first and third Thursdays, and we differ from it sometimes. Just my comment. But I'm I'm you know I'm good with that. I just then I would have a couple requested changes. What are your requested changes? Um, if we could move the 11th and 13th Which month? of January to the 4th and the 6th. And that's because that change literally puts me in direct conflict with I'm babysitting in Atlanta, and I did that based on what our normal schedule would be um, for the little ones. And So um, you want to move all four up or just those two? I'm happy with just doing those two to the fourth and the sixth. Then you still stay away from the holiday. So the holiday is Martin Luther King uh -huh. uh, Day, and, and what we would do in that scenario is move your agenda briefings up to that Friday if you're available. Sometimes people are out of town, yeah, and then get the. We move it to January fourth and sixth anyway. So right, right, which is how it originally was. That um, that said, we would have to get all of those agenda items to you that Thursday night because you need that in hand for your briefing. You know, a blind briefing is not not good for all of you. You like to have it in hand. So, so what is? But Jennifer, the what I was saying is, if you did January fourth and sixth, and then left it at January twenty fifth and twenty seventh, you wouldn't even have to do that. So that that oh, takes care of the staff issue. Except as well. that. Right. Yeah. Except that. Oh, because the third would be the agenda review. Mm -hmm. why, why are you moving the... But it would have to be, it wouldn't go out on that Friday. It would have to go out on the 30th. And I think, and we have moved January around a number of times because will, of that. I will be out the 27th. I will tell you right now. Uh, I'll be gone to Tallahassee for the Florida Council. 
on arts and culture. Just that day? The, uh, what, January 27th or February? January 27th, so I'll have to leave the 26th, 27th, come home the 28th. I mean, tell, you don't get to Tallahassee easily. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I've already got that date, so. All right, so why don't we just move all of January back up then? And we'll just have to work around it for the agendas. So go back to 4th, 6th, 18th, and 20th? Yes. That's fine with me. Or, or I'm just telling you now, you know, I can't make that date. Whatever. Okay. Jennifer, you okay with that? Okay with that, Mayor. Rebecca? Okay, so we'll just go back to the normal schedule for January. Okay. All right, what are your other conflicts? Uh, well, March, we shifted both meetings, and that puts me in conflict with uh, uh, another thing, which is, so that's, so I'd rather, if well, we Well, the reason we did that yeah. was because of Mardi Gras, and, and well, not just Mardi Gras, but uh, St. Patrick's, uh, St. Patty's, St. Patrick's Day. Day. When's Mardi Gras? It's, I looked it up, and I don't remember, but it's oh, March. Six. Yeah. Sixth, what'd you say? I didn't, I'm not sure it's a. It's. it's a Tuesday. I just don't remember, and I think so it might be March 1st. Tuesday. So anyway, okay, I just, but the 17th is, we're not going to have a meeting on the 17th. Right. I would probably miss March 8th and the 10th meetings, just if we do that. But I mean, what well, we so did. So my suggestion was, was we go to March 1st, 3rd, and leave it at March 22nd. But I think that's when the Mardi Gras is. I mean, that was one of the big reasons we brought it up the last time. Let me just look it up. Mardi Gras 2022. Is one. Good morning to Mardi Gras, New Orleans. Mardi Gras <laughs> is March 1st, 2022. <laughs> when is it? March 1st, 2022. Yeah, that's why we moved it. Because the streets will be closed. You can't meet. Okay. Okay, Mardi Gras. So that we go, we're going to go back. That's why, we, that's, that's why we changed all of March was because of those two events, which okay. don't always happen like that. Okay. So mm -hmm. the or Mayor, for those who are watching, I want to be clear that, that we would cancel that meeting or move it because the streets are closed and because the public can't get to the city community. Yeah, it's not right. because we want to go party. Right. It's because mm -hmm. you can't access City Hall. Right. But thank you for that clarification. Yes, well, I, think I mean, that was why we changed March altogether, was because of St. Patty's Day, which would have a closed, closed street. And mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> okay, I mean, you know, that's... That's fine. I'm just uh, putting it out there. Um, and then my preference, not a conflict, but my preference wouldn't be to jam the meetings back-to-back -back weeks in December. I think that makes a crazy holiday season. Yeah, yeah I do too. Could I ask for December, though, Mayor, that we leave it as is right now? Because typically as we get closer, we... And cancel something. Yeah, yeah, which which we actually did this in November, right? So... Um, Let's just kind of get through, and, and, and we'll, we'll regulate the public hearings and that type of a thing, if that's okay with all of you. Is that all right with you? Yeah, it's fine. I, I still worry that we're changing our normal first third too much, but, you know, that's just mine. If I don't have the concern from everybody else, it's good. Well, I, I see what you're talking about, but I think that clearly... When um, it comes to the events where you can't get to City Hall. Where you can't get yeah. to City Hall mm -hmm. or where you know people will totally be out of town, I mean, what are you going to do? Totally agree. But I, I feel the same way about December. That is that is totally pandemonium. Mm -hmm. They have two meet, two weeks of it's So can we put a special note on our calendar then? Mm -hmm. Literally under, right underneath December that says, would like to spread this out or cancel if possible. Just to make sure that, because we're not going to remember mm -hmm. eight months from now or whatever when we're doing public hearings. We need something that... Well, in real life, draws the 20, attention. The 21st has a special meeting, too, of November. I'm just throwing that all in there as well because that's um, after the election. Oh, yeah. So I'm just kind of giving you that. Oh, yeah, I was thinking about that. that oh, the 21st, the is, the, is that the swearing in? See, that's the week of Thanksgiving. But it, 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 it's, it's always been the week of Thanksgiving. I, I, I rechecked. Yeah, it. no, it, it's always, yeah, that's the, that's the, uh, that's swearing in swearing ceremony. In the yeah. It's set. I can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's set by our charter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And why am I griping mm -hmm. about December? I won't even be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, do we want to 
do you want to just go ahead and cancel um, the second week of December? Or you want to leave that there as a just in case? Probably should leave it just in case. You never know what. Like, you know, this December we've got a couple big meetings. So, I mean, a couple big issues. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just can we put some kind of note? I'll just put it at the top. You know how I make notes at the top? I'll just. Yeah, but it gets there. it gets lost up there. I know, but I'm pretty full, and my okay. font is really small. Um, <laughs> so um, something we need something that tells us that I will do. I'll, I'll figure out something. about yeah. hearings in December. Okay. okay. A quick question: yes, ARP. Sir. When when did it, when is the commitments for the projects? ARP. What December twenty three or something? No, um, end of January. End of January. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we'll we'll ask you for a special meeting as we draw closer. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So with those changes, everybody good? So can I just confirm the only changes that um, from this calendar that you're looking at would be to move January back to normal, basically back to normal. And I didn't have yes. any that you agreed on besides that. Is correct? That's it. I think that's it. I'm, given. I'm going to throw a spanner in it, and I'm sorry for that. The Mardi Gras parade. Uh, Donna just handed me this from Jory Peterson. Is the 26th of February. Yeah, there, I think they're added. still going back and forth on that, though. I don't. Are think they? Okay, confirmed. I'm fine with the way it is now. I just had to. I don't. It. I just don't think it's. Wow. I don't think it's confirmed. So I'd like to re recommend March 1st and 3rd for our regular meetings, which falls into. I get it, but I'm saying like, that's I don't. Okay. I don't they're think they're still it's going confirmed. back and forth. I'm not going to fall on a sword over it, but your your, your case is mute now. <laughs> I just don't think it's. Confirmed. It's all good. Yeah, I know okay. they're they're having that. Should it be a Saturday or should it be a Tuesday conversation? Still right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last last I heard. Well, now, that's gone on for a lot of years. It has. They go back and forth. So, you know, that's the thing. Okay. Okay. Now that we've totally picked apart. Okay. So January Sorry, had to calendar. To January is going back to normal. December is going to have a big question mark. Question mark. Mm-hmm. Maybe okay. I'll put a question mark next to the numbers. And then, then we know that we need to revisit. Maybe. That would work. Okay. Well, wait a minute. You moved it out because December was supposed to be, December would have been on the 29th and, this, and the 1st. Yes. Because of the way it falls. Mm -hmm. Just like now, we're the 30th it's and the It's exactly right. the mm -hmm. same thing as what it right. was this year. Right. We'll be next First year. and the 15th. If we left it as normal. Mm hmm But you know the way we've done our, our rules and regulations about the meetings? It doesn't say Tuesday it should be the first Tuesday of the month. It says, Tuesday, it says Thursday, which is why it has to back up the way it does. And maybe at some point we need to look at that. Well, that's, I mean, that was my point. I'm not trying to OCD about no, it. No, but, but the we're first Tuesday. breaking our written rules by. Except the first Tuesday of the month is not the 29th. The first Tuesday of the month is the 6th. Oh, yeah. you're going back. You're saying. I'm we saying. Shift our whole philosophy of being. I mean, if you really want to do yeah, first and third, that. then that's probably. What we, do. we don't have to do it for this yeah. year. I'm just saying we should be looking. I always found that to be extremely confusing. And if I, it's confusing to me, how would the public ever understand it? Yeah, if it's the first and third, then it should be the first Tuesday and the first Thursday, not just the first Thursday. It's acting like Tuesday is a stepchild meeting. Well, it isn't. It's an important meeting. And to me, it should be the first. But we don't we don't have to carry on about it that we'll leave this and we can talk about rules and regulations yeah. and maybe do an okay. example of it and go there okay so we've got our you know what we're doing okay so with those changes can i have a motion to approve <laughs> well i'm not sure what we're all changing at this point but I think it's only january it's january, just january shifting back to the original only change has been january and i noted Question mark for first week of March, question mark for second week in December. Yes. Perfect. I will make that motion. Second. Okay, Commissioner Kynes, Commissioner Franey. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Then we have the proposed agenda for December 14th work session. There is an item that we're looking to add, Nikki. Two, one relates to the city attorney update that I'll give because I would like to seek the commission's direction 
on that point um, at that meeting. So if the um, city clerk would be amenable and if the commission's amenable to adding a discussion about the um, charter um, review committee appointments or direction to the city attorney as, as a discussion item for that meeting. As well, um, it was brought to our attention through the ORC process, but also through the community development department staff that there is an, an error in one of the attachments to your ordinances and we need to fix that error by doing two readings. So um, I'd like to request that that ordinance be added. I know it's not typical to add an ordinance to your Tuesday meetings, but so that we can do the two corrections. Um, it seemed like something if it's okay with the commission that we could get started on that by by doing the first reading at that at that first at the, the December 14th meeting. Um, so it's, it, it, there's a map that was attached to an ordinance that staff identified as, as the incorrect map. You'll um, see the ordinance when it comes, but essentially has been identified as just a Scrivener's human error. But the way to fix that is we, we do have to correct the ordinance. So those are my two items, Mayor and And your item would be under city attorney update, is that what you're saying? The discussion item can be under city attorney update if you have a, a rather full agenda with regard to the yeah. charter review committee appointments, but the, uh, the ordinance yeah, can that be has an to action be. item. Okay. And it would still be advertised and noticed and everything. Um, and in fact, any property owner that, that is affected by the map, which I understand there's only two, will receive direct mailed notice that that correction is going to take place. And, and, and we can go over that more when you consider the ordinance. So I'm okay with it being on a Tuesday, given the fact it's just a correction. We're not changing anything it's we've done. Goodness. Correct. I mean, it's not, Correct. Yeah. It doesn't. It just gets it out of the way. A substantive it's item. It's just correcting an attachment error. Everybody else okay, okay with that? I see okay. nods, so I'm gonna. Okay. So with those two, those are my only changes, Mayor. Thank you for the time. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Kynes, Commissioner Franey. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously with those two additions. Um, we, okay, so let's take a five minute break and then we'll go right on to the Golf Club Sustainability Study Workshop item, okay?
<laughs> All right. Welcome back. Um, now we'll head into our uh, workshop items. These are informational items where we tend to give consensus direction for next steps, but no vote is actually taken. So um, I know we've got a lot of people here, a lot of cards. Um, so we'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, tentatively, the end of our meeting is at 12.30. All right, so we will open it up. And uh, did you have any opening comments? I do not, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Vince? Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Commissioners, Vince Gizzi, Parks and Recreation Director. And with me uh, this morning, I will reintroduce Richard Singer, who is our Senior Director of uh, Consulting Services with the National Golf Foundation. And to, to begin the presentation as a continuation of our Dunedin Golf Club sustainability study completed by Richard Singer in July and presented at a City Commission workshop August 31st, 2021. Today's presentation will be a more extensive focus on future available options for the management, operations, and maintenance of the city's golf facilities. Staff was given consensus direction to work with the National Golf Foundation on phase two, review of management, management options for the Dunedin Golf Club. The National Golf Foundation, Richard Singer, submitted his report to the <clears throat> city on October 6, 2021. Since receiving this report, the Parks and Recreation Department reviewed the management options and our staff recommendations with the Dunedin Golf Club Board of Directors on October 27th, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee on November 10th, and the Board of Finance on November 17th. Richard will now present the four option structures outlined in his report, and I will then present our staff's recommendation. With that, Richard. Okay, thank you. Um, good to be back with uh, Dunedin, my home away from home, home of Honeymoon Island. Um, um, the last time I was here, I guess, was, was August 31st, and we, we talked about the golf sustainability report, and you all, the city commission, you know, asked, you know, what is the best way forward? What should we be, what should we be considering? And um, basically the challenge was to take a look at some options as to how you might go about uh, moving on for the, for the future. So what, what, what we did was in our letter was to provide you with some options, with four options for the city to consider and to provide some guidance on what the impact might be on the city, what your responsibilities would be, how you would have to change employment, uh, what the economic considerations are, property control considerations, keys to success, pitfalls, all of that to help you evaluate um, what your options are and help you understand these options so that you can, can make the, the best move for your city. Um, and we presented these in detail in a letter and a comparative chart that we provided to the city on October 6th. And I'll go through uh, some of that here uh, today. Um, again, you know, just wanting to review the possible change in structure, how it's going to impact the city, keys to success pitfalls, um, and make sure that we understand the different levels of city commitment that are going to be required in each of these options, um, and ultimately leading to a long-term plan for, for success. And in review, ultimately, we boiled it down to four options, which uh, option one is to can basically continue as is, to renew the Dunedin Country Club for another term, um, possibly with some revised contract terms requiring clear definitions about property condition uh, and public access, which were the two main concerns that were expressed to the NGF consultants during our sustainability review. Um, another option is for uh, en engaging in a full property lease, where you could lease the Dunedin Golf Club to a, an, an independent third party uh, in exchange for large capital investment in the property. One of the things that the sustainability review had revealed to you was you have capital issues and capital items that need to be addressed at the, at the <coughs> Dunedin Golf Club, um, and there's substantial monies that, that are going to be required for that. One is to look to the outside world to see if there's anyone in the private sector willing to come forward uh, and bring that capital to you in exchange for rights to operate that property. Um, option three is basically for the city to take control uh, of the property and hire an independent third-party contractor to manage the property for you under your uh, guidance and your um, uh, determining how it, how it should be run. Um, 
you could hire an independent contractor and pay them a management fee to operate your golf course for you. And the fourth, operation, uh, the fourth option was a hybrid operation, which is having the city take a little more direct control over the senior leadership uh, of the property, but otherwise retain a lot of what's already in place there. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, you know, general managers, golf professional, the golf maintenance contract, and so on. Um, so it, it basically provided you with four options, and one of them is a continue as is, and the other three are essentially new operating models. So what I'll do is, is go through some of the details of each of these, and uh, then we can have a discussion uh, about that. So option one, the continue as is option, um, is to continue with your license agreement uh, with the entity known as Dunedin Country Club, Inc. Um, but perhaps as the contract is expiring in June of 2022, the current contract that you're under, you could make some changes to that agreement. Um, uh, it is called a license agreement in the city of Dunedin, but technically, as, as we have identified many times in the past, it is a form of a lease um, that you have uh, currently. Um, you can add new conditions to the contract about property condition, um, about public access, um, when it's available and, and they have a good year like they've had in, in, in the last couple of years, you can collect some income uh, to be used for capital uh, from, from the um, Dunedin Country Club. Uh, keep in mind that the city does have a 225,000 or thereabouts responsibility economically currently um, with, with the uh, Dunedin Country Club agreement. And ultimately, the city is going to have to defi decide how to fund the capital improvements there. We had estimated in our sustainability review about $2.75 million. I think the way the world is working and inflation and so forth, you probably ought to be assuming $3 million at this point um, is what it's going to cost to, to fix the, uh, the, the greens and the irrigation and some other items that we had identified in the sustainability review. I mean, the implications of this is the Dunedin Country Club, Inc., remains in control under this option. Um, budgeting, capital priorities, they have a board of directors, all of that would remain and the ultimate authority to operate the Dunedin Golf Club will remain with the Dunedin Country Club. Um, the city's not going to require any new employees, but um, you know, certainly our recommendation um, if you engage this option is to make sure that your oversight, that the city oversight um, is, is perhaps more stringent about some of your key issues that you've been identifying for me over the years. Uh, the city remains as the backstop to the Dunedin Country Club, the economic backstop that you've been in the past. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's an as-is. It's a status quo option. The city risk remains the same as where you were before. A second option is to, to find a single entity uh, to uh, take over the Dunedin Golf Club property in exchange for some benefits to the city um, and, and some benefits to the club. Most importantly is the capital improvements. The $3 million that you need to upgrade this property should come from the private sector. I don't see any reason really to engage in this option unless you can find somebody willing to put that money up. Um, ultimately, you would have a new lease agreement that would be subject to city review and city oversight. You potentially could collect some lease income, uh, but most of the benefit to the city is going to come from funding the capital. Um, it's, it seems like the $225,000 that the city is currently spending on certain maintenance items uh, at the club would, would continue even under this option. Um, and there's always a risk of vendor default in a lease option. I mean, and I think you've experienced that with what happened at Sterling Links. Um, the city is going to have much less control. I mean, you're turning this property over to an independent third party. Uh, you're not going to need any new employees, but you know, you're going to have to make sure that you uh, uh, provide some oversight, that you audit this vendor. Um, you can reduce the economic risk in this option but I would certainly warn you that, you know, finding a partner for this, you may find difficult. Um, there was a time in, in public sector golf when this was more popular than it is now. There aren't too many examples anywhere in the 50 states where I see this happening right now, where a private entity is coming in, putting $3 million of new investment into a golf club in exchange for a long-term lease to operate it. Um, it does happen, but it's more rare than it, than it used to be. Um, a third option is the management contract option where you're essentially hiring a single entity to oversee the day-to-day -day operations uh, of, the, of the golf facility uh, under the structure and guidance that the city would define um, and then pay them a fee to do that, a management fee. 
Uh, the city would own all the economics on the operation. You own all the revenues. You're responsible for all the expenses. You're responsible for the $3 million in capital. You have control over the operating policies, but you're turning over the day-to-day -day operation to an, to an independent third party, man golf management company preferably, uh, who would run it for you in exchange for a fee. Um, these contracts are typically shorter term. I, I guess I should have mentioned the lease option, which is option two. Um, if somebody's going to come in and give you $3 million to fix the property up, most likely it will be in exchange for a longer term agreement, at least 10, probably 20 years that you would have to do that for. These management agreements are much shorter. It can be as, as short as two or three years. Um, and then the other uh, uh, thing to consider is that the current uh, Dunedin Golf Club Board of Directors could be modified and be created as a new golf advisory committee so that they would still have a say in, in the operations and be able to give advice about how th certain things should be run through the city and ultimately the city giving direction to your management contract partner. Um, the city would, would absorb the full economic risk on the Dunedin Golf Club under this option. Uh, you probably don't need any new city employees to run this option, but again, you need to, com to expand your contract compliance oversight mechanism. Um, to make sure that if you do indeed establish parameters under which the golf club is to be run, you need to make sure that your contractor is running it that way. Um, and the other thing, too, in, in addition to the economic risk, the revenues and expenses of the golf operation, you're also going to have to pay the management fee to your operator. And most all of that is fixed. So regardless of performance, you're responsible for the management fee. And I think the key to success with this option, and I see it a lot, it's certainly an option that a lot of municipalities have engaged in throughout the country and in Florida. It really all boils down to finding the right partner, somebody that you can work with that can manage this property the way you want to see it managed uh, and do it properly. Uh, the fourth option is an option that we created kind of with your staff as a, as a hybrid option, which um, allows the city to take a little more direct control over the Dunedin Golf Club, but retain what's working there. And for most all of the, the senior staff and the, and the policies, procedures, and the way this golf club is being operated, that can continue, but perhaps with a little more direct city oversight. And the key there is to have the city employ the senior staff um, with a maintenance contract and a new food and beverage contract uh, the city ultimately is going to have to fund the $3 million upgrade. You're going to have to add some new employees, and you're going to have to have some contract uh, compliance oversight responsibilities. And the city is going to become responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and establishing policy at the Dunedin Golf Club. You're going to be far more into the golf business as perhaps you have been in the past. Again, I think the idea of a golf advisory committee would be very wise for the city perhaps modifying the existing Dunedin Golf Club Board of Directors uh, into a golf advisory committee to give you assistance in how to run the day-to-day -day operations uh, of the golf facility. And it brings all of the city assets to bear on this. I mean, you certainly have a lot that, that you do as a city that could be helpful to operating the Dunedin Golf Club. And, you know, legal, marketing, finance, engineering, all of these different departments that you have as a city, could, you could bring the full bear, bear of that. Uh, onto uh, the Dunedin Golf Club. So the city would have complete control. You're going to have to retain, hire, retain, and develop some new expertise. Um, you're going to absorb the full economic risk of the property. You've got to come up with the, the, you know, the $3 million in upgrades. And then ultimately, <coughs> it becomes a, a political decision in getting the community on board with this. So I think that that's, that's another option for you. So. To summarize all of that and, and, and talk about the next steps, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Vince in a minute to, so the staff can give you, uh, the city staff can give you their recommendations. I mean, there are four structure options that, that we have identified for you. But ultimately, it really boils down to two options, the way we see it. I mean, it really is an issue of, are you going to hire a private company to operate your golf course for you, which is option two and three? Or are you going to retain some type of city structure, which is option one and four? And that, I think, ultimately really is the big picture decision here for the city. <coughs> ultimately, the city is going to have to decide quickly 
um, because the current license agreement with Dunedin Country Club uh, ends in June of 2022, and that's rapidly approaching. Um, I think if you want to go option two or option three, and you want to go to the street with a formal request for proposal to entice private companies to see if they'll come in, um, I think you've got to get to the street with that. February is probably the latest to give them a realistic option to be ready to take over in June. Um, and the other thing, too, is, and I would, I would point this out as being critical in, in my view, is that the um, golf sustainability report that we had done for you earlier this summer identified capital improvements and, and needed capital improvements uh, to this Dunedin Golf Club property. I think you need to move forward with planning for that, regardless of any of these four options, so that you're ready to hit the ground running with whatever decision that you make. <clears throat> Uh, Vince, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back hey. over to you, and, and the, the city of Dunedin had their own uh, staff, ha had their own review of this, and, and ready to make their own recommendation. Thank you, Richard. Before I review the staff recommendation, uh, I would just like to go run through a few of the decision-making parameters that we, we had created, and all these parameters are very important. Uh, the first one is to retain the history and protect assets of the Dunedin, of the Dunedin Golf Course. I think that this is something that we all want to see. We want to protect this almost 100-year historic course. Um, keep doing, as Richard mentioned, keep doing what is working. Uh, ability to make improvements where and when needed, maintain memberships, increase public access, and maintain ability for members and community to have a voice. So our recommendation, as you, you've heard all four, is option number four, the Dunedin hybrid structure. This option is where the city would be responsible for the day-to-day -day management, operations, and maintenance, including marketing, pricing, and policies. Continuity of operations, staff feels that option four would be the most seamless trans transition versus bringing a private management company in as uh, in option two and three, as Richard mentioned. The users and members of the Dunedin Golf Club should see little disruption in their experience. Maintain membership and current, current usage, again, something that is uh, working for us now. Continue input with new advisory committee. Richard talked about uh, the voice in the community between members, fee players, and the community to be all part of an advisory committee. Ability to develop a long-range master plan and stick with it. Um, due to lack of funding over the years, uh, the club hasn't had this, this ability to put that long-term plan to, together and be able to, to carry it out. Um, this is the, the city is in the best position to fund the capital improvements between the ARPA money and, and possibly the, the penny fund. City staff can provide internal services and support marketing, engineering, finance, fleet, facilities, HR, we have a full team behind us to, to assist us with running this course. Presently, as Richard also membered, I also mentioned that the city presently is subsidizing 225,000 per year, and that is for utilities, trash, water, sewer, building maintenance, and trimming of mangroves. So moving to the, to the next steps, um, the city or would have to employ or contract with senior management staff general manager, director of golf operations, staff assistants could be clubhouse or pro shop, um, establish a grounds maintenance contract. Presently, the club uses a company called Down to Earth, possibly continue with, with, that, with that agreement. Develop a request for proposal for food and beverage, transition necessary with, um, with contracts that, that are in place now. I did talk to our city attorney Day about um, reviewing some of these um, agreements for us and seeing if the city could assume them or until at least they've expired, which would include the golf cart rentals, tee time system, maintenance equipment, and uh, grounds maintenance, as I mentioned, with the down-to-earth agreement. Develop a CIP master plan, design and construction, uh, which, and again, in the uh, original report, the the irrigation system needs to be replaced, greens need to be replaced, cart paths need to be improved. We have the drainage issue on uh, two of the fairways, 15 and 17. The clubhouse needs upgrades. 
uh, maintenance facility needs upgrades. Uh, in the future, the, the bridges will eventually need to be replaced. Uh, actually, today and tomorrow, um, the course is closed, and our staff is working on doing repairs to the, to the bridges <coughs> as, we, as we speak. Also employ part-time staff as needed and establish the new advisory committee. So if option four is, is selected, um, a transition plan would be, need to be brought back to the city commission in more detail. And I know um, our city manager, Jennifer Bramley, is going to talk a little bit more about this. But just there are some of the items that would in, be included. And what we would bring back would be timeline for operations and capital projects, funding capital projects, operating budget, organization chart, positions and job descriptions, contracts, maintenance equipment, golf carts, et cetera, and of course, um, a timeline to accomplish all of this. So I did want to mention that in the beginning, I mentioned the, the, uh, uh, that this was presented to the golf club board of directors on October 27th. It was also um, brought to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee on November 10th, and was, uh, option four was supported seven to, to one. Uh, the Board of Finance met on November 17th and voted in favor unanimously in support of option four as well. So with that, Richard or I will take questions. Okay, so let's just do questions at this point and then we'll open it up. Um, once we determine which um, consensus direction for which option we want to move forward with, I'll turn to Jennifer. Jennifer will describe what next steps look like, similar to what Vince just said, but in her own words. And then after that, we can give some thoughts as to what we want to see included in her next steps if she hasn't covered everything. Okay? Mm -hmm. Just trying to lay it how, yeah, how I've been. Okay. Uh, I've, may I ask a question? Yes. So you're saying we're going to ask questions of this, of this, of this proposal, and not discuss any of the others? Or... Oh no! You can ask. Okay. No, no. I uh, know okay. you ask what. On, I'm just saying right now. I'm just trying to lay out how I kind of thought it might move effectively. Ask whatever question on whatever option there's four that you want. I'm just saying once we determine okay. sort of the consensus of the option we want to move forward with, then we'll look to Jennifer about next steps. So that's that's what I'm saying. We don't need to worry about next steps in this part of the conversation. Yep. We can then have that conversation. Are we going to give After. opinions before we get there? Uh, well, I was really hoping to hear from the public first. That's kind of why we do that, is to try to... No, no, not. that's fine. That's fine. So Just, after, after they... They'll, we'll yeah, then questions. we come back and do our opinions. So we're, we're only asking questions of their proposal. Uh, no, any of the four. Okay. We know what they're recommending, but if you have questions on the <laughs> other three, feel free. Okay, so questions. I'll start with you, John. I mostly have comments, so. Okay. But I, have quite, I, I can ask a question. Um, Vince, um, number one, <coughs> concerning the involvement of additional folk, uh, people, et cetera, um, if the city, city steps in um, and we have city employees that are directly assigned to that, of course, that's an increase. Um, and it's, it's, also, it's also a different um, perhaps a different type of employee that may be, may be working, in my opinion, in my experience of having been involved in many, many of these uh, golf tennis uh, operations. So it'll have, a, it'll have a different situation. Now, will, will there be allocations as far as you would know then, additional allocations of costs from the city uh, attached to this? Because those would all be additional costs to the cash flow if we're just looking at cash flow. So I, I think the answer is yes. Um, so, I'm, but, but I'm just asking you. Yeah. Yeah. The an the answer is yes. The we're looking at the general manager either to be employed or or contracted, uh, director of golf operations, and there would be revenues that are coming in uh, to the operation to cover those costs like they they do now. Oh, to cover those costs like to do now, those costs would probably be higher. And then I'm also asking, are there additional, additional back uh, people that you would be expecting to, to be involved right, with? Right now, they have five full-time employees, and I, I believe we would be at that same number. 
Now they do have full-time employees in, in the kitchen. Uh, their, their chef, I believe, is a full-time em employee, but we're looking to contract out the food and beverage. But I understand all of that. I'm asking city employees. How many city employees would you yes. have? And we're, we're, we're gonna continue to work through that, and that's one of the things we will, when I mention what we're gonna bring back, would be an organizational chart, um, positions, Thank you. Thank you. Funding. If that's the direction you go in. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask if that's coming. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that that's coming. Um, then the second, the second uh, point that I had um, about the, um, the city being involved in this as opposed to how it works today. Okay. Why do you think this would be a better way of functioning than it, how it functions today? Well, I, again, we said we want to do what's, what's working. We would continue to do what's working, and that means membership is working. Um, so there, there are things that are working. There are things that need, need improvements. Uh, the main reason that I see it is the long-term capital, that, that the city, if we're going to be funding the long-term capital, I think it's been already stated um, that we would want to have more control in, in the input of developing that capital plan. Um, there's, there's, you know, it's been discussed about uh, the maintenance budget. Uh, Richard in his original sustainability uh, discussed talking about increasing that maintenance budget and I think you know, the city would be able to, to accomplish that. So those are two reasons, my two biggest reasons. So if we're, if, if, if we're going to spend money or spend money, let's say it's $225,000 um, then that just needs to be spent by somebody and whoever can expend that the, the, most, the most fluid. In every case here, as I understand it, the city is going to pay 2.75 or $3 million to get this course updated. And all four of them, forget how it's stated, or you could say, well, this one said this, but we're going to pay, we're going to pay for that. Because I want to make, that's going to be in my comment, comments later, but but the city is going to pay for that, that upgrade. In option four, yes. In all options, the city is going to pay for that. In all well, options. in option two, which is the um, private, where, they would where a company could come in, a firm could come in and pay for all the capital and all the operations. That's correct. For a long, for their, in return for a long term. I understand what it lease. said. You're, we're going to pay for it. There's going to be a cost for that. There'll be a significant cost for that. Not the I, city. Hmm? Not the city. That would be the outside. I, uh, okay, good, thank you. I'll when you say we're I'll gonna pay comment. for it, my understanding was. The, nothing's free, nothing's free, nothing's free, and somebody's gonna have to come with $3 million to put down in that, and therefore then we're gonna lose, we would then lose some flexibility, serious flexibility. So I'll just make it, I'll just leave it at that. We're gonna lose serious flexibility over, over, over historical property of ours which is an incredible piece of property, as far as I'm concerned, um, and I'll go into the history about that later. So, but it, so we're gonna somebody's gonna pay for that that three million dollars in period in all four cases. Somebody's paying for that. Yes. Okay. Um, so, again, I want to come back just to one more thing um, about the the efficiency of how it works now and the efficiency of how it would work with the city. You're stating that you believe that you're going to be more efficient than what they are. And then I'd like for you to just, if you'll answer that question. Well, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the two things that I mentioned of why we're moving forward with this. And one is so that we can accomplish all the long-term capital improvements and that I feel that we'll be able to invest more in the, in the annual maintenance of the golf course, which seems to be... Um, needing a, a little, and I think it's, you know, I think the club would agree that, you know, main, the maintenance budget needs to be increased. So you can do that more efficient, my question was, than what they can do. The money will be spent. I feel we can. Okay. I'll, I'll let somebody else ask some questions. I'll come back if I have any. Commissioner? Yes, um, I've been wondering, and I did talk to Jennifer about this, if you had the capability of the ARPA, for the 2.753 million, what would be the differential between that 2.753 million uh, 
and a true restoration of this 100-year-old course. The true restoration, which might have to be done, you know, point by point. I mean, I'm not sure that it could all be done at one time, but um, to restore it to what was originally done 100 years ago, um, and we've often talked about our downtown, it's been incremental. You know, we've done one thing, we've done another thing, but so I think it would be a long-term plan, but what would be the differential if you talked about, right now you're talking about irrigation, greens, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever talked about the bridge thing, but yeah, you know, um, some of those things. And um, so what's the differential? If you were really talking about a restoration, how much would that be? Well, I think it's, it's, it's somewhat undetermined. I think you could assume that it's similar. Um, in, in size and scope, although the, the restoration plan that we reviewed when we did the sustainability review did not include an irrigation system. It had some other components um, that were being addressed, and it was, it was more. Um, I think the bigger concern that we had about the restoration idea was what it leaves you in terms of the maintenance footprint and the required maintenance footprint that the restoration would leave you. Uh, a much higher square footage of bunkers, um, a different layout, and just more intense maintenance responsibilities that I thought were, were concerning to our team um, versus repairing um, uh, and fixing what you have in place, fixing the greens, doing new irrigation, fixing the drainage on the two key holes, investing in cart paths, bridges, tree work, maintenance facilities, and putting, putting that quality product forward to the community. Um, you know, it seemed to us to, to give you the best, the best option going forward. The full restoration plan really isn't complete at this point from what, what, what we have seen. I'm not sure that, that anyone has really completed a full plan about that, but it was more expensive um, than what we had estimated, uh, and it did not include a new irrigation system. So I, I think that... Which is a re really big part of the, the upkeep, the everyday upkeep, if you don't have the irrigation system. Right. Can I uh, ask a question on that point? Sure. Um, the full restoration that Commissioner Kynes is asking about, doesn't that make the course um, a lot more difficult? Not necessarily. I mean, it might. I think that that has to be flushed out a little bit more. I, I think it adds to the appeal with a certain segment in the golf uh, community, but I don't think you should presume that that's <laughs> universal. I think the vast, as I, I think when I was here in August, I said that to you, the vast majority of golfers are looking for good quality maintenance, that subtleties in design are, are going to go over their head. But there are a segment of golfers who will notice it and will seek it out. I mean, the Donald Ross Society is, is internationally known, and there is a whole segment of golfers who travel the world seeking out Donald Ross properties, and they will come find the Dunedin Golf Club if you did this restoration. But I'm not sure that that's enough to sustain you. I, I think is the point. Okay. Well, that's why I was asking. I, I mean, I've, I've sort of been led to believe it makes the course more difficult, which then sort of bumps other people out yeah, of it, wanting it might, to... It, in, some, in some aspects, it could end up that Go way. Ahead. Yes. Sorry. Well, I, I thought it was worth asking because we have talked about it. <clears throat> they do have the 100-year anniversary of this course. And then you talk about, you know, what is the appeal? What does call people to this course? Uh, Jennifer tried to explain to me about the bunkers and that in the original Donald Ross there were many more bunkers in that course. Um, so that was one of my questions. Um, on the advisory committee, um, is, it, is this going to be a mixture of community people and board people? I mean, because a community person may not uh, belong to the club, but they may be a for fee player is my is my understanding is that correct yes in, in my notes I had that uh, we would continue with new advisory committee uh, with members fee players and the community there's a lot of people that just like to go and enjoy the restaurant and a lot of people well um, if you looked at something we have like the CRA um, you know they they even have neighborhood people that because they're uh, that are directly affected by whatever's happening or interested in whatever's ha in happening in the downtown area. I, I'm, that's sort of a um, you know some sort of comparison. Yeah, the makeup of that committee could be brought back at at our our next meeting. But you know, my thought was to have 
make sure there's members, make sure there's fee players, and make sure there's community people, and that could be the people that live right right in that neighborhood, right in the Fairway Estates. And how well do we believe, because this was a, um, and this is going to be a question, don't worry. Mm -hmm. um, how well do, do we believe we have actually tackled um, the issue because of the interrelation of history and what? I'm oh, sorry, I said God bless you to the commissioner. She, she said God bless you to the commissioner. Oh, oh, you said God bless me for going down this road? <laughs> See? Once again, it's her fault. <laughs> I'm sorry, commissioner. Um, okay, so my question is how far have we actually come? Because it is an asset, it's a historic asset, and I cannot understand. I, I'm just thinking there are real. Uh, sort of ropes of in, in, entwining between any kind of bed and breakfast or the Fenway or the other hotels that they should be sending people directly to you and say this is a historic course. I mean to have that kind of uh, flow uh, between a historic course and the, pa the places people stay even more so a historic hotel. Uh, so you know, your question how is, far have we gotten in that? Because I keep talking about it, and I'd, I'd really like to know how far we've really gotten to uh, embracing that, uh, what I feel could be a very strong appeal or public relations appeal, marketing appeal. Can you answer that? Well, as far as the what's happening presently, that might be a question more for the, the golf club to okay. respond to. But I think that we but could. But the intention. But I think that, right. yeah, because we, we right. talked about having this full team, you know, talking about running it efficiently. Again, we would be able to use our marketing team to help us, yeah. help us with that. And, uh, yes. I mean, you look at Superness and Antonella, and it's like, you know. Well, even our business uh, recovery task force, whatever we call it, our business alliance could also take, you know be a part of that discussion. Okay, I think those were um, sort of my, oh, one other, food and bev. Um, is that easy? Is it hard? Um, I mean, uh, to approach that, I'm just very curious. Uh, you work throughout everywhere seeing some of these contracts with food and bev. Is that pretty easy to get that? Or is it, I mean? <laughs> Well, he nothing, said no. Yeah. <laughs> he shook his head no. <laughs> nothing related to a, uh, you know, the operation of a municipal golf course is ever easy. Um, but I think that there's two ways to answer that. One is the actual operation of a food and beverage um, operation is, is difficult, is a challenge. But I think finding somebody qualified to help you with that, you may find, is, is not that much of a challenge. Um, and there's, there's uh, most cities in, that I work with and, and, and throughout the country, there's always somebody you know, locally, a restaurateur or somebody who would look for a satellite operation and can bring a level of expertise that can really help you and can grow, help, help you grow that and expand the appeal of that. Okay, and so then I want to know how the GM uh, interfaces with that. How does your general manager interface then when you have a, another satellite entity uh, working under them? How, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, that's I, a managerial question. It's a, it's an appropriate managerial question, and it's it's ultimately how the city wants to wants to be in oversight. Ultimately, the city's in charge, and it's the same type of thing as I was going through in my presentation. I mean, it's it's going to be a contract situation, and the city sets the terms for the for that contract, and ultimately, it's a contract compliance issue. You know, we, we have put this out for you to come in and run the food and beverage operation of the Dunedin, Dunedin Golf Club. Here are the parameters under which we expect you to operate, and we're going to make sure you all do that. Okay, thank you. I think I've grilled you enough. <laughs> that wasn't a grilling. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Vice Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I might overlap some of Commissioner Kynes' questions in relation to uh, the restoration, so I do apologize for that. Um, The, the, the concept of putting the, the capital improvements, um, they, the difference between what's been proposed for the capital improvements and the complete restoration back to the original course, they, they do parallel, 
I, and, and that's the question. Do they, do they parallel when it's just that original restoration goes further than, than what's being considered now I think or talked about now? I think that's a fair way to, to look at it, but I also point out that at least the, the Spencer plan that was presented to me did not include a new irrigation system, which I think is key. Um, let's not go down that road, please. Okay. Everybody will have their chance to speak, so let's show these gentlemen the respect they deserve. Thank you. Okay. And I know that we've had the conversations already about the challenges of the challenges challenges to play the original course that it might alienate some people. Um, might find it difficult. Any golf course I play, I find it difficult. So, uh, so that's a different conversation. Me too. But <laughs> you and I are the drink girls. We're the yeah, golf we, cart drink we, girls. We don't. Uh, but. If we were to take it from, I know that we've talked about with this capital improvement, we'll be able to increase our fee play, the, the price the, to, to play. Would that, if we were to take it back to the original, would that price be even higher? Not, not just to pay for the, the, the capital improvements, but because it's, because it's now back to an original. I guess I know we've talked about $93 or whatever, possibly. Yeah, I think it's fair to assume that's probably a parallel, like you said in your, in your introductory comments. Okay. So, so it's going to get to a point where no matter how much capital improvement you get, that, that, that fee isn't going to, depending on the time of year, isn't really going to increase. Maybe. I mean, there's other factors at work. I think right. that, you know, ultimately the maintenance condition and, and the demand, I mean, you've had some very strong performance there and the strongest month ever from what I'm, I'm just told. I mean, so there's opportunity to, to push fees up, but I don't think you want to be too aggressive until you've made some capital improvement there as right. to whether the, you know, the restoration option takes it to a much higher level. I think the true answer to that is maybe. Um, but I think ultimately you'll find that the maintenance condition is probably going to be a bigger driver than, than, than the restoration option. Okay. And, right, we're kind of working off the timeline of the current contract expires in June. And so right now, I know that we really haven't discussed the capital improvements, but um, as far as the timeline for those, those, those will be coming. Uh, so right, but right now, nothing would basically be considered to be done in the 2022, right? So we're looking at maybe design of in 2023 and then ex expenditure in 24, right? Without, well, I'm not pinning anybody down. That's just, is that how far off base am I? I, I thought that? it would be to do the design work <clears throat> in 22 and the improvements in 23. Okay, okay. Oh. Because my follow-up question to that, and Jennifer stepped away, um, I might have to repeat it to make sure that she's here. But I'm wondering, my concern is food and beverage and ideas and what we want to do in food and beverage. And I know that's going to take time to do. So I'm wondering the importance of sticking to that June expiration date on the contract. And, and I, I, this might, I just... I don't know when to have this conversation, so I want to have it now, or at least the, the, the thought process and the question. Uh, that also in this discussion, is it possible that we have, Jennifer, I'm talking about the possibility of extending the current contract with the board. Uh, and it's all over my concern over food and beverage and what we might be able to do with that concept. And whether this is even a discussion to have that in June, instead of hoarding ourselves and just trying to throw everything in because, you know, is that an arbitrary stop date or is it possible to extend that three months so that we can actually have some thoughtful consideration under food and beverage and, and put in there? Is that the right time or is that later? I think later? that's about the next steps period. Yes, uh, I'd like to address that during my comments. Commissioner, I agree with you. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, then that's all that I have right now. Okay. Commissioner Franey. Okay. Um, first, I just wanted to clarify. You said this, but I kind of missed it. Um, Finance Board and Rec and Parks Board both saw it and recommend number four? Yes. And what did you say the Golf Club Board said? It wasn't a vote by the Golf Club Board. What was the sense? It wasn't a vote. 
there wasn't any consensus, there wasn't, were there screams, were there, you know, what was there? <laughs> there were a couple of members that spoke up and the rest of the members um, didn't so did you have your give much input. Your microphone. Microphone on. Oh, sorry. And spoke up positively about the, number four the, or negatively the, about number four? The two four. that spoke up spoke up positively. Okay, thank you. Um, Why wasn't there a vote? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I want to know that. Why wasn't there a vote? Well, we weren't actually asking the, the board of directors what option they would want to see Why on, not? on this. No, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean it to, I'm not trying to be aggressive with you over there, Vince, but I mean, we, everybody else took a vote. Why wouldn't they? Uh, we didn't have a vote, Mayor. Not a quorum or? We, we didn't have a vote. The The look like there's going to be some type of, of change and that's going to affect the, 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 the club and the operation. So there, there was no uh, vote by the board of directors. Okay. And, and, they, and they, didn't, they didn't, no one on the board of directors spoke up and said, I want to, you know, should we take a, a, a vote on, the, uh, on how we would like to see the operations go. Well, maybe we'll, maybe we'll so, get a... So, so yeah. did, I, did I... I mean, I know we've all talked to Mike, what, but I mean... No, what, I, I, and I, I apologize because I didn't get to every member of the board, but I've been, I've talked to several of them, and, you know, I've gotten a good sense that, you know, you may have gotten a, a vote that was for well, number four. I, um, but I, yeah, it would have been actually kind of helpful to have a vote. We, we were the present, you know, when the city came in as the presenters, um, the board of directors didn't didn't call for a vote. Okay. Well, there's many here today, so. Yeah, we're gonna may, hear from They may be able to clarify. Um, so, um, one of my questions was right to the heart of uh, Commissioner Kine's question, um, food and beverage. Um, and and I, I understand how you answered it, but your report says, NGF also notes the difficulty in finding qualified vendors to run food and beverage operations at municipal golf courses. Several other Florida cities have struggled to find and retain a good partner. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so true. So, again, side comment is we need to be very careful because, I mean, I think that we have an operation that's running pretty well right now, and we don't want to make it unstable by thinking we're going to get something great, and then we can't, and we lose what we have. So just my mode of caution. I don't want to get stuck in one place. We, I think we just need to be very open there um, between what we have and what we, um, what we can potentially have. Um, what do we spend annually for the golf club now? Two twenty-five thousand. The two hundred. The, the what? The cities. Yeah, the our ongoing annual. Yeah, it's two hundred and twenty-five thousand, uh, and of, that is for our cities, utilities, trash, water, sewer, and we also pay for a private contractor to come in and uh, trim the mangroves three times a year. Okay. And as I said, right now we're. We also, and that's building maintenance is a big part of that. Yeah. Right, and ongoing 000. capital, which they're, they're under the square. We won't even talk about cart barn. They're under the square um, footage. You know, which I think our email just said, you know, that's the best example of not doing well, but uh, we would have to step up our game, obviously, from that. Um, so the other thing goes to the heart of the restoration. Um, based on the initial report from you, Richard, you were. I think you kind of reiterated that. And I mean, I know after reading the report, I kind of was like setting it aside. Um, and I know that the last time we talked, there was a feeling of maybe we need to understand it better before we set it aside. I know in talking to many members, including board members, um, I'm getting a sense that there's a small group of people that want it for the golf course, not necessarily the bigger group. That may be true, that may be not true. Um, but it clearly seems like this commission might need to understand better what those differentiations are, you know, my fear is you increase the cost, you increase your annual maintenance cost, it's going to increase the cost of golf, and it's going to potentially, and this is a worry I've heard from members, it will push us out of the game. You know, it'll be made for this segment that can afford it, but we won't be a part of that. And so it will be less of a community golf course. Can you respond to that? I mean, it's difficult to say. Um... I think that it's unclear at this point exactly what the exact program of restoration would be and what it's going to leave you. I think the, the primary concern that we brought out in the sustainability review 
and that I would reiterate here is my concern about what the maintenance footprint is going to be, what they're going to leave you behind. And our, our main concern at the time of the sustainability review was that the club was not spending enough on maintenance as it was. Um, and that to add to the maintenance responsibility at a time when you're already underfunded in maintenance was the greatest concern that we had. And we think, and our point was, is that maintenance condition <clears throat> is a primary driver for appeal and economic success in public golf as opposed to subtleties in design that the vast majority of golfers probably don't even notice anyway. Gotcha. Um, Can I ask a question along sure, that line? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just don't want to have to talk about it all over again. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, so, given everything that the two of you have just sort of had a dialogue on, is it a waste of effort or money to possibly lay it out where let's get the golf course in premium condition the way it is, but premium condition, if you will. And then, you know, because we've already discussed that at, uh, we're going to have to do these major investments at probably every five to ten years, we've said, maybe ten. And then over that period of time, you look at some of those sort of restoration pieces. Incremental. Incremental. where it's not, maybe not a complete restoration, but you look at, you consider things like maintenance, you consider things like attractability, you know, is that a waste of, of money to do it that way? But I mean, can it be done that way where you wanna maybe, okay, and again, I am not a golfer, but I'm just throwing something out, you know? We want all one piece of it to be this way now, back to the restoration, but the rest of it's okay, is that? And so it's sort of like a goal that it can be considered? Yeah, I mean, maybe, but I think it's difficult to answer because, you know, the, the primary issues in, our ca in the sustainability review, the capital plan, is irrigation and, and greens. And I'm not sure about the restoration and how that fits with the greens. So are there certain contours or slopes that the restoration plan has in your greens and then you go out as you just said, and you address your greens now, and then you come back and the restoration plan says, well, in order to properly restore a Donald Ross design, you're going to have to redo these greens again. Um, you know, I think that doesn't help you. Well, no, but, but I'm, I'm saying, I'm like saying said, in the ne for the next capital improvement yeah. situation, I'm not talking about two, three years from now. I mean... I think the idea of always can... investing in this property and trying to make it better will, will help you in the long run. So if there's it's subtle things you can do... Yeah, if there's subtle things you can do, add a bunker here or make a change here or there. Um, okay. um, I don't see how that could hurt, no. Okay. Sorry, Commissioner. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking about I'm it. talking about, long, I'm talking about, yeah. you know, and I five, you. ten I, years from now, over time, looking at certain things. And I don't know right. if, what those things are. Or... No, I'm not a golfer either, but, but I did do a tour with a couple of board members. And I don't know, I just, I got a sense, doesn't mean it's real, mm -hmm. that we'd be doing it and redoing it if we yeah, did that. I, I did but, too. but again, I, I don't know enough about the restoration plan to be clear. I just know what I'm learning. Um, and my last question would be, um, Jennifer, this is for you, and you'll probably do this as part of the transition plan. Maybe you haven't really thought about it a lot. Um, as far as who the general manager would report to if we made this a city operation. Mm -hmm. It would be part of the transition plan. Uh, and I have thought about it a lot. I know you have. <laughs> I don't want to say it now. Okay. No, I don't. Okay, fair enough. Okay, I'll let it go. I, that's all my questions. Okay. Um, in, I'm going to go back to food and beverage, too. I have a couple of questions, but a lot more comments later. Um, you talked about, at least in the budget, in the larger report, it uh, <coughs> was... You put about 80 grand in there for expanding the outdoor seating, whatever. Um, you also mention in the report about, you know, updating the interior, carpet, wall, chandeliers, you know, those things. Um, but I, don't, I only see a dollar amount for the expanded outdoor seating. I don't see a dollar amount for the interior. Refurbishment. The refurbishment. 
Yeah, I, I don't recall. I mean, I thought it was theme enhancement, and then when I read your definition of theme enhancement, it talks about signage, roping, benches, water, all washers, markers, planks. Right. I would have never thought that. On course. Th yeah. So I, I don't see a dollar amount in there. Is the, is the remodeling of the clubhouse outside of the outdoor dining, is there a dollar amount in here for that? Uh, I don't. I don't recall that. I don't I, see I don't it. it I mean, I've me. looked for it actively. But I think that you probably could assume then that 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 our focus was more on the golf course playing area itself, and that the some of the interior uh, concerns. Um, I, I do believe there was some in there for it, but I don't. I don't know that it was substantial. But yeah, I, I don't. Was, I don't see anything in there was, other was, than the outdoor dining. It was. It was. It was intended to be more basic. So. Any experience with rehabbing a a clubhouse and a dollar amount for that? I understand it matter. It makes a difference if you're moving walls or not. And I'm not even talking about moving walls. I'm just talking about remodeling. Yeah, I mean remodeling or just repairing or fixing. Um, remodeling. Yeah, I mean a full remodel on, on that. I think you have to start thinking about it in terms of a dollar per square foot and just and doing some calculations. You know, do you want to do a $75 a square foot remodel or a $150 a square foot remodel? Um, you know, and okay. start to put some numbers to that. That is not what our sustainability, we did not presume any of that in the sustainability okay. review. So um, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that, you know, hiring a restaurant consultant type of a person, um, somebody that understands, you know, ROI per square foot, how big your bar is to make the optimal amount of money, how big your restaurant is, how many seats, potential there is, is it laid out correctly, what all of that, it's it's not unreasonable to consider that as an option. I, I wouldn't think so. I, I think as long as... it's not something you focused on. Well, yes and no. I'm, and, and my answer would be, it, I don't think it's unreasonable, but I think you want to make sure that it's done with the focus of, of golf and golfers. Yes, I the, the no, I understand. It has, to, it has to have both elements because, right. you know, well, we pointed a restaurant open to the public and then there, there is the aspect of our you know right well you i think you want golfers so it's two different and there's also all the special events right um that have to be accomplished. you know that occur that just somebody has to be so all of those things have to be considered when determining best use of space certainly absolutely okay. I think you right. want a golf. Uh, I think you want a food and beverage operation that primarily serves the golfers, but can also function in some of these other areas and, and function as a as a restaurant for the area that people who don't golf who want to come in and enjoy it. And certainly, um, you know, the ideal space that you have there for events and parties and banquets and all of those things that are not related to golf at all. Absolutely. Okay. Can I riff on that sure. for just a minute? Um, you said a restaurant consultant. Uh, consultant, but you know what? You're also talking about a design consultant because I know people design how country clubs look. I know that there's specialties in that, yeah. and, and you know if you're gonna, you've got to, you've got to incorporate design because it's well, also. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, I, I think I'm saying it all. I'm, I'm saying I would think we would want to know. Does the bar, is the size of the bar or the bar room appropriate? Is the, are there rooms in that clubhouse that aren't getting the maximum space or maximum use and could be rearranged some way? I mean, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, if we're going to do it, I. No, I, I mean, I, I've just been thinking about, um, Meese Life has just done their bottom floors and mm -hmm. they're gorgeous. I mean, but they called in, they didn't even really change things, but it was all about color and feel and good wearable rugs because you have so much traffic, traffic and so it, freshness, you know. So, I mean, I'm just saying that that's even apart from yeah. if you make the bar bigger. Right. It's how does it feel and look? Is it, you know, is it welcoming? All of that. If, if, I, if I just sure. could jump in just because the only thing that comes to mind is because you did talk about this in the original report, even the setup historically of how you come into the thing, you know, how to really focus it on its history and, and all the things that are there as, as you come in, just that whole feeling. But I have to tell you, Tracy McMullen trained me, though, 
it's about gall. Don't lose sight of it. It's I about know. gall. I know. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so we always keep our focus on that, even though because no, no. Vietnam for golf, people aren't necessarily going to just come there to be a restaurant. But, right. but you also want to bring Special in history. people from the community. That's one of the things we've always said. And if you do Vietnam that. Vietnam for golf. It, it, We're not going to have a self-sustaining restaurant. That is absolutely true. But I'm saying if you want to bring up in another segment that don't play golf, then you have to have that welcoming. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's all about balance. Okay. I am going to um, open it up to the public. Um, we have 40 minutes to get through this. Not just the input, but the direction and then the other two discussions. We have a lot of cards. Um, we do. Is there anybody here that's willing to maybe combine some of their comments and speak longer? We've got... Jeez. By May, Mary, Seven, eight, I don't have nine, a time commitment. 10, 11, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, is everybody okay, else okay on their time? Absolutely. I know you have a one o'clock, right? I do. I'm good. Okay. Rebecca, Nikki, time? Okay. All right. Uh, Mike, come on down. Mike Beatty? Yeah, I'm looking at you there, buddy. Mike Booming. Okay. That was a good conversation you guys just had. All kinds of questions on things. If you have any more, please ask, and you know, I'll get on it. Um, let me put on my glasses. I was finished. I was counting on fo following up at the end mm. instead of coming up first. So that's all right. About five years ago, I think I sat right at that table right there with Steve Lowther. If you all, some of you remember that you were here. Um, and that's when you let us kind of take control of the, of the um, golf course and everything else. Now, at first, it's very difficult. When something's down, you know, pretty low, it takes quite a bit to, to bring it back up. So it, it took us a couple of years working on it. But now we have everything pretty much in order, aside from having to, you know, fix up the course somewhat. I mean, we're making money off the food and beverages. We're making a good amount of money off of food and be beverages. Um, we have pretty much full uh, tea times. Uh, we've got a lot of players playing in there. Uh, we've got several members there too. Everything's going very well right now. I can't really see why we need to change. I think that everything is moving along great you guys would have to put up the money to have the the course got taken care of it, no matter whether you give it to us to do it or if some other people come in to do it but right now you got a, a country club that's working very well we've had we've set up uh, things with the fine arts center that we've had events there for that for pretty much everything. We have Rotary that's been there. They just had their, I think it was the 50th year uh, celebration in there, a ton of people in there. Uh, we're open to everybody and working with anybody in the city. And these things are actually coming together. I never saw the Fine Arts Center and the golf club get together before. And I sat on both boards, so huh. I know. And that's why. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, things are working very well the way they are. So why don't we just go ahead and get the everything taken care of out on the course and everything's going to be good. I don't see why we need to do anything aside from what we have right now because it's working. We had the cap fund money right away. Here's the check. You know, we're taking care of everything. Are you hearing any bad things about it? Everybody's uh, very complimentable to me, so that's, I, I don't want to drag it out. I, I think we're in good shape right now. 
let's leave it as it is, let's sign another five-year contract, let's get the course and everything taken care of, and then in 2017, we can uh, come up with an amazing, or I'm sorry, 2027, we can come up with an amazing party for the 100th anniversary of this. Having a Donald Ross, cor Ross course is like uh, having a Frank Lloyd Wright house. You know, oh, you've got to build it up and, and let it be. And that's the best way to do this, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost a little more to do it. We could turn it back into, a, the, as Donald Ross had it. We've got plans, everything else. We hired a um, golf architect, Chris Spence, to come out and take a look at it and give us some plans on it. And, um, you know, we put that in there. There's going to be no stopping us. So, Mike... Yes. I, I know you spoke with each one of us. I mean, I know that yes. I, you spoke yeah. with me. And yeah. I guess my question to you is, why didn't you say any of this when we talked? Because I, I did say a little bit about it, but we mm -mm. kept talking about the different choices. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I never, yeah. I never got the impression that you as the chair or that your board was against mm -hmm. this at all. I never got that impression from our conversation. So I, I just want to know what's changed. No, really nothing has changed. I mean, I've, I've been for the golf club the whole time. I have. But when you and I talked, that the talk was about this. And this, uh, the one that Richard brought in, the one he's uh, recommending, that's what you and I were talking about. Yeah, but you didn't tell me you were against that. Oh. You, didn't, you didn't tell me that you wanted it to stay the way it is. I mean, we never had that dialogue because I, I never knew that that's how you felt until this very second. Well, I'm sorry if I didn't and, get my You know, just in, in fairness to Mike, I just want you to know, I mean, he, you did say that to me. Yeah. Unlike other board members who actually yeah. probably yeah. would be more for four. I'm sorry if you didn't get that, but I thought that the conversation kind of started off on what the rep, rec, recommended from Vince was. And... Um, I thought that was what it was, and we were going to move on from there. So then I was trying to figure out what would be the best I, thing. I on have that my notes sense. here from yeah. November 11th. Wants the hybrid plan. Yeah. As the city is recommending. Yeah. As opposed to the other ones, yes. But I thought this one was off the table. I'm uh, sorry if I confused you in that conversation, or if okay. I didn't put myself out the way I should have. Anybody but, else have any questions for Mike? You know, uh, uh, can I ask us something? That's the I, I'm I'm really wondering uh, whether not having the board take an actual vote uh, has been a difficulty because I can't I can't read your minds. You know, um, I wish I could, but. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of wondering, uh, you know, I thought that was a very salient point. You had the Parks and Rec, correct, and the finance, but you'd get the people that uh, are now, say, some of the primary users and board members there now uh, never indicated their preference. And my thoughts all along were that those four preferences were before you. And that's what I thought too, Mike. I, I really believed that we were talking about those four preferences. And I, I thought you were talking about four too. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I really believed <coughs> that. So, um, you know, I don't know. We're, we're a funny. Well, we want to hear from everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm yeah. only focusing on Mike because he spent you know, time calling, he's yeah. the chair of the, the board, so, um, yeah. Commissioner. Yes, thank you. Um, a couple comments that were made previously to you talking about how uh, another segment, <coughs> another choice might do something or, or make something better that you implying that was not taking place. Um, I've been actively involved, of course, with the uh, with the golf club, not only as a liaison previously, but, but very interested, and I'll get into that later, as you know. So, um, as I understand it, um, it, not only are you making money, and I used to look at both ca categories, the golf, mm -hmm. and then I would look at, at, the, at the club. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the problem, at one point in time, 
the big problem was in in the in the uh, in the facility and the food, and and as I understand, that has been that has been well taken care of now. Absolutely. That's that's where it stands. I, would you confirm that? Yes. Second of all, is there anything that you haven't done there that wasn't because of the lack of money? Uh, I know we talked about we've talked previously um, many times, and I've sat in many 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 meetings talking about some of the requirements, I'll, I'll use the word repair, because we don't use that in golf, to repair the course, um, to whatever that means. And the reason why it was always that the money wasn't there to do that, and it wasn't. That's correct. And now you're working your way back up to that, as I yes. understand it. That's correct. Too. It is still a city asset, just like, just like the Dunedin Fine Arts Center is. Okay. Correct? Yes. So, so I am correct. The only reason why those things weren't taken care of was simply because of, of money, and you now have some monies coming in. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Just want to make that. And, and also a comment, because other comments were made, I never had any doubt in any conversations that I've had about the fact that you would like to continue uh, in, in the capacity that you are. And, and, and continue with the course being being that way. Mm -hmm. Just for anybody that wants to hear that from me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I know it's others have said others, and that's fine, and, but that's me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't want to elongate this. I want to hear what other people have to say, but just, you know, just to be clear, since you're asking why change, the premise of the report was if the city taxpayers are going to put in up to 2.75, which I think is going to be more like four in the end, mm -hmm. yeah. is my personal opinion, that the city needs to take more control. So that, that premise, I just want to make sure for people watching this, that's one. And the other thing is, and I, I'll have the consultant confirm, the other thing was that was concerning to me, even though, trust me, I, all the board members that I've talked to and know, amazing, everybody's working hard, really great people, but the survey itself between members and non-members at the Dunedin Golf Club was significant, I mean, significantly different perspective of, of how they're treated at the golf course. And nobody's intending to be bad intent. It's just that mm -hmm. there, there's this feeling of inequity. And, and Richard, can you just comment? Didn't that come out in the survey? It did, but I mean, that was a very specific point in time when that was sure. done. And it was, right. you know, it several months ago, but that, that was the case, yes. It could be different. So again, I think it's just that taxpayer community perspective, mm -hmm. you know, so again, because you know I have great respect for you and the work that you've done. And you guys have done amazing with this golf club. Yeah. Well, I am a, I'm a member yeah, out it. there. Obviously, I have been quite, for quite a while. I can tell you I spend probably over $1,000 a month there with eating and everything else. Um, so, you know, I may get waited on a little faster than somebody else. I, I, I don't know. I don't ask for it. I, I don't see it. You know, but naturally, you've got to have members have to get something for being a member. And, yeah, and, pay, and paying all that money. Thing. I'm just so I mean, it's only fair. They are going to get probably a little bit better than a non-fee uh, player. Sure. So it's, uh, but it's not intentional. Like we don't go out and say, "Oh no, that's and, a, and you I know, didn't mean you get out of that, that cart." The member wants this. <laughs> it doesn't go that way. I, I did not mean to imply that. Yeah. I'm just saying what the study kind of gave us yeah. a different perspective yeah. that maybe we all just need to think about. Yeah. You know, a couple, even a couple of your board members said they were surprised to see that because they don't see it either. They, they feel like yeah. they welcome everybody. Yeah. And who knows? I mean, who knows what reality is? But again, when you say why change, those are some of the considerations I think we all think about up here. Okay. You know, okay. but, but it's taking nothing away of the amazing job you guys have done over the last few yeah. years. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear from anybody that felt they were, you know, not treated yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have any questions for Mike? Uh, no, okay. Thank uh, you, Mike. Uh, Mayor, I'm sorry if I didn't get it through to you. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Maybe maybe my brain wasn't working. <laughs> All right. So we're not going to do the back and forth with everybody. It's just that Mike yeah, was no, no. the chair. Okay. So the next person is um, Jody Cannon. But he gets to follow that. <laughs> Hello, Commission. I have to tell you how excited I am about what's getting ready to happen with our 150th, our 100th uh, centennial birthday. And the, the greatest thing here is the fact that you are the commission and the committee members that are making this happen for this city. 
it's your watch that this is happening, and congratulations for that. We're very proud of that, and it seems like things are not really steady. We're changing a little bit, and these ideas are good. They're all good. I am um, Jody Cannon, and I've been a member at the Gunnedin Golf Club for, since 2006. I've seen many changes. The changes that are getting ready to come about are the most exciting that I can think of. As I look at option four, since we had decided, the, uh, uh, Vince Gilly decided that this was the one that the commission wanted to go with, that the, the part of that that upset me a little bit, it kind of got me off kilter, was the idea of changing the food and beverage opportunity of the club and putting it into a personal uh, outside source. This is a little confusing to me in that let me give you a couple of pieces of information that maybe you don't know. And that is that right now our food and beverage and uh, banquet uh, operations are bringing in approximately $950,000 in this year of 2021. Almost $1,000 by the end of the year, a million dollars, excuse me. That's quite remarkable. And uh, under the, uh, the tutelage and the leadership of uh, our Chuck, uh, he, um, he honestly, with his wait staff and his cook staff and the, and the, uh, the beverage uh, staff, he can do just about anything in that restaurant. And he has done everything. There are so many things that can be done. And he can, he can serve a four course dinner with 250 people efficiently, effectively. We can honor our uh, educators in an annual breakfast. Uh, and I know that most of you have been there and know that how, what a great job that we do with that. We have uh, one of our three Rotary Committee, uh, our Rotary Clubs meet there every week. What we do there is, is really totally amazing. And actually 80% of the money that is taken in, the revenues from this um, food and beverage operation that we're running right now are coming from non-members. We have a large, large uh, influence in our community and we sit tight with them and we're important to them and we're good to them. This change is a little bit upsetting, and I think that we have to really look at it. I thought it was interesting that the National Golf Foundation, when they looked at this, they had a whole paragraph in there about the, the challenges to bringing in a new food and beverage outside source. It was, it was quite interesting to read it. I suggest that when you get into the possibility of looking into what will actually happen, that you look at this, and I, if you'll forgive me, I would like to read a couple of sentences. I know that Mo brought up what it, had, what it had said, but it's something that needs to be focused on. I'm sorry, I need you to wrap up because I've got to keep everybody to three minutes. Okay, all right. So I guess the bottom line is, um, if the goal of this city, if the goal of this commission is actually, and I know that it would be, is to maximize the public service to the community of our Dunedin Golf Club, and to actually provide the best economic benefit to this city, then we have to seriously consider this food and beverage movement and the operational opportunity to keep it where it is or to move it independently. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I have to say this. The one thing that I do need to say is that the food and beverage that our uh, club provides truly is our foundation. Thank you. Uh, Steve McCarver. Okay. Greg Dixon. Hello. My name, yeah, my name is Greg Dixon. As you said, I live at the corner of Ben Hogan and uh, Nelson Street. And just to kind of give a little a little background. I remember when our realtor showed us the house, we pulled into the neighborhood and we moved down here from Pasco. I had no idea that there was a golf course there. I saw the golf course and I said, we'll take the house. And at that point we hadn't even seen, haven't even seen the house, well it was kind of a wreck, but uh, nonetheless I've lived there, played golf there since 2001. And what I'm, what I, the nice thing I see about what's happening here today is I've never felt like the city was behind a golf course. I've always felt like it's kind of a golf course against them. And I've also been on the other side of that feeling like the membership is against other people. Uh, now I'm a member, I've been a member for, I don't know, four or five years. But um, I think the main thing is I'm just glad to see that 
that there's a dialogue that you guys are going to protect this asset that we have because uh, it's just it seems so valuable to me to have a Donald Ross Coors such a great place to play when it's in good condition to have it so close I do feel like we don't market it anywhere like we should somebody brought that up earlier I was glad to hear that so I won't hog a lot of time I just kind of wanted to get up and say I'm really happy that we're talking about this and I was thinking the whole thing to go along with what Mike said. I was thinking the whole time, why is this such a thing that we have to change everything right now when it seems like it's working really good? Why can't we, why can't we just extend this out and make a decision later? So thank you for your time. Thank you. Chuck Winship. Um, Chuck Winship, uh, lived here since 1976, uh, actually have been playing the golf course since 75, so I've seen it from all points. Uh, my professional is golf professional. I've uh, been in the Hillsborough, Pinellas County area 50 years, uh, managed golf courses for 35, 25 of those were municipally operated and owned. So I know where you are right now. I've been up on that dais. Uh, I'm also on the board of directors for the golf club. I also am uh, in favor of number one, without a doubt. Uh, the food and beverage operation is very tough, as uh, Mr. Singer has indicated. The possibility... I've tried it, couldn't find anybody that wanted to do it, okay? So I know how tough it is to find a company as large as it's going to take to do our $1.2 million uh, business and operate within the hours of the golf shop and the golf course because there's a lot of hours in there that are not profitable for their type of business that they're going to want to come in, but they're going to have to do it anyway because it's a service to the, the people that are playing. Uh, beverage cart, you know, there's all kinds of little odds and ends that they're going to have to come up with. Uh, the city's going to have to come up with a whole new pay scale for their employees, because golf course employees don't get paid what the city employees do. When I was at Tarpon, we had to set up a whole new setup of things for uh, golf course staff. Uh, the things that we've done, board meetings, I'm new member for the board, but we've already had people come in for marketing. We've had a proposal come in for that that we've, uh, in order to get out there and have the, the, uh, a professional come in so that we can market the golf course better to the public and to the hotels and such. Uh, we've done quite a bit. We unfortunately have, uh, in the last three, four years, gone through three superintendents, which was uh, the reason that the golf course got in worse shape than it should have. And uh, I think everybody from the general public to the staff can take credit for or blame for that because uh, nobody complained enough to the people that could do something about it to get it done and get it uh, taken care of properly. Uh, I'm included in that. I've been a member there for six years on top since I retired. I uh, still work at Chi Chi's, help out over there a couple days a week. So uh, anything you Thank can you, do, we appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tony Mitchell. Hi. My name's Tony Mitchell. Uh, I've been a member of the club for about 23 years. Uh, I also was president of the club in 2004 through 2006, and I served on the city board of finance for about 10 years. I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into looking at this issue, and as I read those recommendations, you know, there's some overlapping continuation that goes from one to four, that there are a number of areas there that I think careful collaboration between club members, city people, and others 
could find an ideal kind of solution. I have to say our food and <coughs> beverage is going so well. Um, you know, we really, Friday nights, fish nights, we really get at least two-thirds of the people there are not golfers at the club. They are city residents or from the area. So I just hope we give very careful consideration to all of these recommendations and appreciate being able to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Judy Nichols. Tracy McMillan. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, before you start my timer, let, uh, let me address the issue of um, why we didn't vote. Uh, I am on the board. I was there that evening that Vince and Richard uh, Presented. We didn't vote uh, because, as a board, it was uh, a presentation to us. Uh, we were not anticipating taking a vote. It was the first time we had heard uh, what the uh, city recommendation was going to be. Uh, so in advance, we were not prepared to uh, have that lengthy discussion or have the vote. Um, and, and really, frankly, we were... Um, I'm off. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, we were uh, we were told we were not asked um, for our input on the recommendation. Uh, it was simply presented to us that evening, and and I will say, um, it was a raw meeting. Uh, I think I've mentioned this to a couple of other people. It was a raw meeting that evening. Uh, people who were in that room were advised that um, they were going to have to uh, re-interview for their positions, um, and uh, if you can imagine. Uh, that's a little bit of a shock to your system um, when you think you're doing a great job uh, at what you're doing. So um, the, there was some internal discussion after the presentation that evening, but there was no vote. Thank Any you question that. on that? Thank you for that. Um, so now for the formal part, uh, I'm Tracy McMillan. I'm a Dunedin resident, and uh, I am a golfer at Dunedin Golf Club. And I'd like to make just two brief uh, uh, points today. First, I'd like us to think a little bit out of the box, and, and I'm speaking uh, my opinion. I'd like us to speak a little bit, uh, I'd like us to think a little bit out of the box and consider a fifth opinion, a uh, fifth option. And that would be a hybrid of the hybrid, so to speak. Given the investment the city is making, it's logical to bring in your own person to run the business day to day overall. If it was Macmillan Golf Club, I'd do the same thing. But I would ask that we not outsource other areas and rather take advantage of the expertise in place. Utilize it correctly, but not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have a, as we've said previously, a unique community and service culture at that golf course. <coughs> and we cannot afford to lose that. Secondly, and I have said this to some of you before, and it has been repeated this morning, at the end of the day, it's about the golf course. And the golf course is in need of repair now. It'll take a lot of expertise and detail and transi uh, to transition it and to improve it. But I think Richard Singer would agree with me that if we fix it and market it, they will come. Changes on the horizon, Jody just mentioned that as well. I ask that we pivot quickly, work together on the go forward plan, and hit the ground running with that plan as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. Uh, Mash Sutton. Uh, I know y'all thought I went away. Ha. 
<laughs> well, you did go away. I did, and I'm back. Now you're back. Yeah, Welcome. I'm back. And i um, been back three weeks. Good for you. And um, I live at, on Ford Lane, and I'm on the number two tee box. So I get to see a lot of fun and exciting things happening there. Four and a half years ago, I stood right before most of you and promoted your purchase of the golf club. And it's been running like gangbusters ever since. Ken and Chuck have really worked hard to get us where we wanted to be. And now it looks like we want to punish them for all that effort. I play golf at lots of courses. We used to play at Tarpon Woods. We used to go enjoy that course. We don't go there anymore. They outsourced their restaurant to Beef O'Brady's, and it went downhill ever since. And people go to that golf course and never go back now. Look what Billy Casper did for us. I think that shows an example of how outsourcing can be a problem. I've been back three weeks, as I just mentioned. We unpacked our vehicle on Monday night and crashed after our long drive back from Maine. But Tuesday night, we were at taco night at the club. And we've been at burger night and the fish fry. And our newcomers group goes there once a month. Our newcomers board meeting meets our, has our board meetings there. And we are treated well and with respect. During COVID, the meals, we were there at the door picking up our COVID meals. We tried to support the club as much as we could. It's not about the money. It's about the people. It's about the community. I do play golf, and I don't know anything about golf course management, but I do know when a golf course needs help. Our golf course does need some help. A little bit on number two with some filling and irrigation, 17, 14 and 15. You need to wear your mucklucks when you go out there on, after rainy days. But that is just some work that needs to be done, minor or major, to get the irrigation under control. Someone in the group joked at break about talking about the um, gutters and, um, and during the road thing. If we could put a few gutters on number 14 and 15, we might be able to play there better. I don't know anything about golf management, as I said, but I am a retired Pinellas County school teacher, and I can't afford to see the prices of playing golf at Dunedin go up to $80 and $90 a round. My husband is considering becoming a, a member, a single member, because we can't afford to join as a family. So let's consider those kinds of people, not just the Donald Ross um, followers. Thank you. Thank you, Mish. Nancy Niven. Losing one now. Hello, everybody. Hi, Nancy. Um, I am Nancy. My family owned and operated a golf course in New Hampshire for over 50 years. My husband, Russ, and I joined Dunedin in 1990. We Dunedin joined the Dunedin Country Club. Russ was on the search committee to choose a golf professional when the position became available. The position was put out there through the PGA. Um, to its members, there were over 25 applicants. Six were chosen for interviews. John Falcone was chosen, and over 20 years, he's still doing his job here at the club. The same should be done for the golf course superintendent through the Golf Course Superintendents Association. When someone is chosen, the course they are currently at should be visited by a group from Dunedin in person, if not vis visually. Many PGA members are also um, um, certified as golf course general managers. Um, this golf course is in need of an irrigation system, as was also mentioned. mentioned. Of other, the most important things are greens, tees, fairways, and rough. Our greens are in dire need of proper care. The current course employees do not even know how to cut a cup. You should never be able to see where the previous cup was. Uh, management companies take their money first. You get what's left. We found that out when we hired one at the course one time. We had contracted them. So anyway... Oh, let's see. Uh, even at 89, I hope to continue being a member for several years to come and hope the condition of the club will be back as it was when we first joined. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Kevin Janica. Hello. My name is Kevin Janiga. I'm the uh, president of the Nanita Men's Golf Association. We have about 60 members, and I'm also a former board member. Um, I'd like to pose a question. What would you do if you found an original Rembrandt painting in your attic? Would you leave it there and let it continue to collect dust? Would you give it to another painter and let them update it as they please? Or would you invest money to find a Rembrandt specialist that would restore your priceless painting to its original luster? That is precisely what the city of Dunedin faces as a dilemma with its own masterpiece, the Dunedin Golf Course. Should they let it slowly deteriorate, make wholesale updates, or do an authentic restoration? We believe an authentic restoration is the best path forward. As the first steps towards that restoration, uh, about six or seven months ago, the club applied for and received a $15,000 grant from the Donald Ross Society, and we commissioned a master plan. In February of 21, we hired Chris Spence, a noted golf course architect that specializes in restoring Donald Ross courses. After evaluating the course, this is what he had to say about our course. He said, Dunning Golf Club exemplifies some of Mr. Ross's strongest and most strategic work. It should be restored and preserved for generations to come. We will be able to authentically restore this course to what I believe to be one of the most historically significant Ross designs in Florida, if not the entire country. And Ross's motto, speaking about playability earlier, is golf should be a pleasure, not a peasant's. So the course would be very playable if it was restored. Now what's included in that plan, and I apologize for interrupting earlier, but uh, he addressed four things in the master plan. One, address drainage issues and install a new state-of-the-art irrigation system. So the $3.8 million in the restoration plan includes $1.1 million for an irrigation system. Uh, we would also restore and regress all the green complexes and green side bunker complexes. We would remove trees and reestablish the original holes and sight lines. And we would regress the fairways and restore the fairway bunkers and teeing grounds. How much does this cost? $3.8 million and would take eight months to complete. So we'd have to close the course for eight months. In recent years, there's been a lot of other municipalities that have embarked on the same journey that we're considering. Mooresville Country Club in North Carolina restored their Donald Ross course in 2016. Prior to the restoration, they were doing $800,000 a year in golf revenue. Post-renovation, they did $1.8 million in 2020 and are approaching um, $2 million in 2021, a $1 million increase. Also, the cities of Charleston, South Carolina, Wilmington, Delaware, Wilmington North Carolina, and Mill Creek, Ohio, have all done restorations on their historic golf courses, most of them doubling their golf revenue. So I think that's one of the things that kind of gets lost a little bit in a sustainability plan. So in closing, uh, we think that a restoration of $3.8 million would generate a, at least $800,000 a year in incremental revenue, and we could pay that back in five years. Um, there's a couple things that would help the community out, would make us financially sustainable as a golf course. A restored Dunedin golf course would attract thousands of destination golfers across the country, generating millions of dollars of additional tourism revenue for the local economy. Third, it would enhance real estate values in the surrounding Ke neighborhoods. Kevin, I need you to wrap it up. Okay. And then finally, a restored course would uh, bring back all the design elements of 100 years ago. So, I would, in closing, I would like to fully, I appreciate your support. I think the sustainability study was extremely well done, and I'm glad to see that we're considering making an investment. My only comment would be, if we're going to spend $3 million to do a, what's in the sustainability study, why not spend a million dollars more and do full restoration? Thank you. And then in closing, my wife is a children's book author, and she wanted to give each one of you a book about Scotty runs for mayor of dog eating. Aww. <laughs> Aww, that's awesome. Thank you. I've got That's kids. Yeah, I've got That's kids and grandkids. I got grandkids. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Thank you. That is wonderful. How oh, cute. That's okay. Uh, Chuck? I'm not going to attempt that in the last name. Russman. Russman. Sorry. Sorry. I should have known that, but. That's right here. Thank you. 
All right. Well, here I am, uh, Chuck Crossman, current uh, general manager of the Dunedin Golf Club, uh, city of Dunedin, home of Honeymoon Island and Dunedin Golf Club. Um, about two weeks ago, uh, all of you attended an event at the club. It was the Dunedin uh, City Employee Holiday Fund Night. I say F-U-N night. It was a fun night. Uh, during that uh, evening, uh, there were 22 people working at the club that night, along with your staff and your spouses who served you. Um, so when we talk about the staff of the city of Dunedin, you also have to include the staff of the Dunedin Golf Club, because we are here to serve. Back in 1955, the city of Los Angeles Police Department had a contest. And that contest was to come up with a motto. That motto was one by a wife of one of the police officers, Joe S. Dobork. The motto was to protect and to serve. As your current general manager of the Dundee Golf Club, it's my responsibility to protect and to serve the employees of this club and the members of this club and the community. So I strive to protect the assets of the club. I strive to protect the employees of this club. I also strive to serve the community of this, uh, or of this city and to serve the employees as well as the members. So my commitment to you is this. I will always protect and I always will serve the city of Dunedin, the community, and the staff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, uh, Michael Pendleton. Hello, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. I'm Michael Pendleton. I'm the uh, current accountant and controller of the Dunedin Golf Club. And uh, I'm in my fourth year when I arrived. Uh, you were one year into your uh, current agreement. The club was near bankruptcy and couldn't pass an audit. So to be reelected, uh, you've probably heard... Um, Am I better off to now versus when I was elected? I want you to, to know that the club, in every performance measure, financial, uh, anything you can look at, is very strong. And I, I won't bore you with statistics, but uh, we're doing very well, and we've, we've exceeded ex expectations on performance. I want to say thank you for your commitment to the, the uh, course going forward. I mean, there's, there's no stopping what, what can happen to this course locally and nationally. It's like the Wrigley Field of, of U.S. golf. So in, in a sense, at the end of the day, it is about golf, right? Well, I, I beg to, to uh, have a caveat. At the end of the day, it's about people. That's a beautiful piece of land. You can look at it, but it doesn't do anything without blood, flesh, and tears. And I'm talking about staff that are passionate about what they do and who are experts in their field and, and are there to uh, make it the best it can be. And I haven't seen it in any of these recommendations and proposals, but people make it happen. We don't need to be punished for being successful. I don't know if that's a social phenomenon that we're into now, but the current operating management staff, we are successful. And I explicitly ask to retain that success. You don't know, you don't have to go out and look for expertise to come and can, to make it happen. You've already got the expertise and we're making it happen. I humbly ask you to retain Chuck and his staff, John Falcone and his staff, and Mike Pendleton and, and my staff. We're, we're doing a great job with the investment in the golf course, it's, it'll be off the charts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I don't have any other cards. Oh, can I ask a question? 
You may. I just want to, I'm Gary Huffaker. Uh, Say it I'm, to a, the, in the mic, I'm a Dunedin resident. I'm on the board. I'm the treasurer of the board. I wanted to address Mr. Uh, Tornga's uh, questions about uh, the additional employees. The uh, cash thrown off from the business will cover the salaries. That would not be an additional budgetary expense. We expect to have about a million bucks in the bank by the end of the year. Um, so even if you talk about three million or $4 million, we're going to be contributing to that. Once the um, basic infrastructure requirements are addressed, I expect that the course will be self-sustaining and will fund its own capital improvements. The reason that we didn't fund capital improvements in the past was because we built a clubhouse we shouldn't have built, and we paid mortgage payments instead of putting money in the golf course. It was, it was a decision that in retrospect, was probably a poor decision, okay? But that's where the capital went. Um, in terms of our management staff, you've, you've heard a lot of accolades. I just want to mention, during COVID, um, we had to close the restaurant, and we, Chuck managed uh, the food and beverage. We never lost money during the whole time. We didn't lose any money. We didn't lose one dollar during the COVID. Golf revenues are, are really great right now. John's doing a great job. You have 70 years of experience managing golf clubs. So, you know, I really, I really think that it's important to emphasize um, that we've got a pretty good staff here and you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. On the other hand, we cannot sustain the golf course without a capital infusion. It cannot go forward without help from the city. So if it's the hybrid agreement or a hybrid of the hybrid agreement, as Tracy said, it doesn't really matter to me, but we, we need to fix the golf course. Once it's fixed, I think it will be very successful. And I think going forward, the, the golf course actually will fund itself and it will not be an ongoing uh, drain on capital money for the city. That's that's my opinion. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, I guess it is. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, know I had to fill out a card. I haven't done that. Uh, I'm probably going to once again make myself um, the most unpopular person in the room, but I've been there, done that, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm Dave Lefford. I'm uh, chair of the Board of Finance. Um, the Board of Finance has followed this issue very closely for um, the seven years of my tenure on the board. Um, and in the last five years that I've been chair, we have kept it as a regular monthly agenda item. Uh, we followed both of the licensing agreement renewals. We have come to you with comments. Uh, we have been very consistent with three comments that we have made to you over those years. Uh, one, we do recognize the um, asset that is this golf course, this highly valued asset. Uh, we have always recognized that. We have always wanted this to remain a top quality golf facility. We've always been on the same page with that. The third, third comment, we kind of sometimes go different directions. We <coughs> have always felt that it was reasonable that this golf course enterprise should be financially self-sustaining. And by that, we mean not only to pay for day-to-day -day operating expenses, but also set aside for capital when improvements were necessary. That obviously has not happened over time. If it had, then we wouldn't be looking for three or four million dollars from the taxpayers at this point to upgrade the golf course. That has not happened. Um, but um, based on all of what has been presented in this sustainability report, there is absolutely no reason that shouldn't happen. As a matter of fact, in some of our discussions, he even alluded to being profitable. We aren't even going there. We just want it to financially sustain itself. So um, we have looked over time and over years of time, we've looked at the financials, we've looked at the audits, we've looked at the sustainability report, we've looked at the recommendations, and as Miss mentioned to you earlier, um, we did at our last regular board of finance meeting in November, a uh, motion was made, passed unanimously, that we support option four. Now, that said, there were a couple of 
recommendations that were very important to our conversations. One is if we do go to option four, if we bring this enterprise under the umbrella of the city, it is an excellent opportunity that we establish this enterprise as an enterprise fund. That being, it will, the revenues generated will pay for operating and provide for future capital needs. Very similar to a marina, very similar to utilities, and we see no reason that that should not happen. Equally as important, and this, I'm very pleased that the members are represented here. This golf course is owned collectively by all the residents of this community. 5% of those residents, based on their numbers, play golf. Dave, you gotta wrap up. 95% of them own this course, don't golf. Where is the voice there? So the advisory board that is established should be in equal numbers, golf club members, daily fee player members. They play two thirds of the rounds of golf at this golf course. They should have a voice on this advisory committee. And there should be residents who do not golf, who has a, have, have a vested interest in this because they own it. That's the message I bring to you from the Board of Finance this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I have to have a bathroom break. Yeah, I'm, 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 I can't hold it any longer, so quick five minutes. I didn't. I just didn't want to walk out while people were speaking. I, you know, so I. You didn't want to handle way. handle over the.
Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do now, just because there's been so much dialogue about why change from one to four. So I'm going to look to our consultant advisor to just give us a summary over um, <clears throat> the differences and the things that were found between one and four so that we can have an uh, intelligent dialogue here. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of good information and a lot of, a lot of passion, obviously, um, uh, about the Dunedin Golf Club, and I've experienced it before. I, I would remind the, the, the current commission that, um, you know, we've been at this for a long time. Um, I've, I've, I go all the way back to 2007 in working for the city of Dunedin. I've been with the NGF for 30 years, and almost half of the time I've been working with the NGF, I've been working with the city of Dunedin. So there's been concern about, about the property, and I think ultimately it seems to me from the outside looking in that there's always been this disconnect in Dunedin between what the city really wants from this property and what it actually is. And it seems to me that, that option four gives you a chance to provide a little more city input into what's going on at the club and to address your main concerns about that, um, that this is a city property for the benefit of all the residents of Dunedin rather than a private club that for the benefit of a select few. And there's no question that this, is, this has turned around a lot. I've been consulting with the city for 14 years. This is the best that this club has ever been in the 14 years that I've been there. And that's certainly, and the passion you see it from the staff and the people working there, there's no, absolutely that's the reason why. Um, I think that to respect that, it seems that option four gives you the best chance to do that, to, to provide a little more city oversight, some strategic big picture guidance, long-term capital planning, rather than making short-term decisions with what is essentially a volunteer board to bring a little more big picture strategic guidance so that the planning is a little more concrete um, and it's not on, on, on a day to day and, and running month to month that you're running this on a five year plan rather than, you know, how are we going to get through July type of mentality. Um, and at the same time, you know, retain a lot of what's working there, a lot of what's doing what's doing well. So I think that that hybrid gives you that best chance going forward. Um, you know, and the capital. I think is the, is the last piece that, that I would point out. I mean, you're, you're getting ready to invest a lot into the property. I think you want to make sure that it's, you know, done right and done as part of a plan and then that it's being managed and operated properly uh, when, when upon completion. Jennifer, did you um, have any other comments that you wanted to make? I in, do, Mayor, In regards to how it's laid out and yes. how all of that can be adjusted. Yes, I do, um, and I want to thank everybody for all of their comments here today. As uh, Richard anticipated or stated, we did anticipate that folks would be passionate because they love the club and they love the asset. Your uh, microphone. I'll start all over again. They love the club and specifically the asset. So I, I really want to kind of break this down to the mission critical. And it was mentioned several times and through all of the comments that everybody made here, and that is to protect the asset. And I would say, actually, mission critical is to improve the asset. And the asset belongs to the public at large. The very beginning of the sustainability study, the, the most important uh, uh, path for us moving forward was to ensure that we invested properly within this asset. And if the city of Dunedin taxpayers did, that the city of Dunedin would have oversight into, into that investment. And by oversight, I don't mean that, that the city of Dunedin would specify in their financing plan what goes where and how it goes. I mean that the procurement process is transparent. This is, it, when you look at our ARPA funding, which is how we've designated this, the, you know, the expenditure for the golf course right now, um, it is our second largest, I believe, uh, investment, or would be if it's, if it's approved by the city commission. So it's crucial that the plan, the financing plan, funding plan moving forward is very transparent uh, to the public at large. And the only way that I know how to do that is if the city of Dunedin uh, takes over oversight of, of the course itself and those expenditures. That said, depending upon the option that all of you go, you know, move forward with today, and that would be consensus direction, not a vote necessarily, I would ask that you give us time, staff time to, to uh, provide to you, all the five of you, and those members of the club and the board, 
uh, and certainly the employees with a transition plan subject to input from the board themselves. That will take us additional time. So I, ha I wrote down some notes here, and I believe that it was uh, Commissioner Vice Mayor Gao who said we need a, a thoughtful transition. We don't just need a thoughtful transition, we need a thoughtful, systematic transition. And in order to do that, we're gonna need at least uh, six more months from June, and perhaps more beyond that, subject to the input of, of the board and the city commission as well. We need to do, um, uh, in my mind, three things. The transition plan, which would be human resources, contracts, RFPs, you know, for food and BEV, or not. It would be the funding plan, which is most important for the city. You know, Richard had, had, um, had stated that would be 2.75 million. Everybody, I think, sitting up here acknowledges, Richard acknowledges, the folks sitting in the audience acknowledge it's gonna be more than $2.7 million, because that doesn't include you know, four, some My of us say. Four. Just say. We need to improve the clubhouse at the same time, yeah, I believe. We do. we do, absolutely. And one of the things that I want to be very clear about is that just like other large-scale capital projects that we funded, there are a number of different sources that we can point to, and we can leverage our resources. There are low-interest loans that, that we can, that we can uh, apply for. There are uh, uh, funds that we can tap in order to pay for those improvements and really do it right. Um, and also then the transition plan, there's a funding plan, and then there's a marketing plan as well. And I'd like to move forward, work with Sue Burness, uh, and work with, with the club as far as a Chamber of Commerce, visit Dunedin, what that marketing plan looks for like when we're done, and then also the timeline for where all this starts, you know, and when it finishes, uh, and specifically what improvements that we're going to make. So what I would ask the City Commission subject to, uh, to subject, um, cons um, Consensus direction today. Um, if it is four, that we we work on the transition plan and come back to the city commission with that transition plan, and that we would work with the existing uh, um, board to that end. There there are some other uh, um, issues that that are uh, that we need to talk about a little bit about here today. We have uh, there were three main funding sources as uh, two main funding sources as, as a result of the pandemic and an SBA loan in the bank account right now. So there's about $525,000 that, that um, were uh, acquired by the club in PPP money. That's the, that's the emergency um, uh, gap money from the federal government and a, and a, a small business uh, administration loan as well for $150,000. The first loan, which I think was about three hundred twenty-five, dollars um, has been forgiven. The club requested that be, and it has been forgiven. The second one has not been forgiven now, and we, and we cannot apply for forgiveness um, as the city. So only the Dunedin Country Club Incorporated can apply for that forgiveness, and we need more time in order to, to do that. So uh, we would like to work out a transition plan agreement with the, the existing club, with Dunedin Country Club Incorporated, and bring that entire transition plan back to the City Commission uh, for your approval, and, and most likely with the, the agreement as well moving forward. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner Kynes, I'll start with you. Okay, um, Richard, I, um, while I do believe that, that it's going to take more time, it, you're saying by February we should hit the ground running somehow, but I don't, I don't see it. I mean, well, February would be still. Well, that, was, you, that was only if That was we primarily if just if you're doing option two or three. I mean, yeah, if you invite some outside, I mean, it sounds like that's off the table now. So I think, I, you know, I think, I think two the or three changes. are off the table. I. I and I, I'm going to tell you, want to know where I'm going? Yes. I really liked, <laughs> yes. yeah, it's always such right. a surprise. <laughs> it's always helpful to know where you're going. Um, I, I like Tracy's idea that it's a hybrid of a hybrid. I really like that idea. You can tell that there's some real strong belief in the managerial staff. So I will tell you that I'm not sure about the food and bev thing. I mean... It, you know, we're, I'm hearing real conflicting things. He says it could be really hard. I'm hearing a very impassioned uh, members that are saying, we think we've got the best in that way. So I'm just, you know, I'm going to tell you my ideas, and everybody can disagree with me. I don't care. Um, on the restoration cost, I still, okay, you're one saying 3.8. We're all saying that whatever it costs, it's going to be more toward four. 
What I'd really like to know is a real differentiation, and I ask you that, on a, a real restoration cost. And I understand also what you said. The most important thing is to get out there and get the maintenance done. I get it. But I'd like to know um, the restoration costs uh, versus the, the needed improvements, that differential, differential. And per mesh, I heard you, that I would like also like to, to have some idea of would this cost, uh, would it cost out um, our citizens? Would it cost out, because this is a city of Dunedin project. Um, so I've already said, I think, you know, it's, yes, you have really done an amazing job coming from here to here, but nevertheless, it is, it's not like, oh, we need 100,000, that's not true. I mean, we're talking a four million, probably, you know, and, and that's a lot. And we sit here and, and we, we have to, we're the, 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 you know, the scales of justice because we support, you know, we support all of you all and we support our citizens both. And so we've got to weigh that scale of justice. And I will tell you, I've had many people come and say, you know, uh, you know, I thank you for Dave. I don't know if Dave Leffert's still here. I thought that was very interesting about an enterprise type fund. Um, I think on the community board, I think it should be um, community people and residential people just so, almost on the CRA. It should be board members. It should be um, fee players. Um, and one of my final thing, again, on the food and beverage, I'm just not sure about that. And um, I'd also, on the marketing, I think we're just missing out. It's just, it is such a, it, it is a historic, um, a huge historic asset that we are really missing out on because of our marketing. And I will tell you, I think Sue Burness and Antonella could just tear that one up. I mean, they could do it. I have not a, a single doubt that they could just major help in that, um, in that particular avenue. So those are my thoughts. I think we are more talking about a hybrid of a hybrid. Um, but again, you got the scales of justice. You know, you've got our citizenry, we got $4 million investment, and you have the club members that have worked so hard and love it and have worked so hard to bring it from here to here. So somehow those scales of justice have to uh, equalize. Those are my comments. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Franey? Sure. I mean, I got notes everywhere, so I'll try to make this coherent. Um, I, I love the scales of justice comment, Commissioner Kynes. I think that's great. I mean, it, it's tough. I was sitting up here, um, and I get that change is tough. I get that actually the club is really doing really very well. I, I think the expertise that's there is great. Um, but up here, you know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, but it's still being run by club members. And and I think, you know, when I look back and I think, well, you know, we, we took over the golf uh, facility itself. We're subsidizing 200, when I say we, I mean the citizens, the taxpayers, subsidizing $225,000 a year. You know, we built the cart barn. Could have done better on that one, give you that. But either way, it had to be done and we did it. Um, now we're looking at anywhere from three to $4 million in investment. So, I think when you look at that scale of justice, you do, because we have citizens who do feel this is a community asset. And trust me, I, I'm really, regardless of how we run this thing, so many citizens that I've talked to is, and I think Kevin said it um, when he was talking about the restoration, but he was just talking about, he had this feeling that the commission didn't always back the course. And you know, I felt it a little bit up here myself, and I felt it within myself. but. Your report changed that. It's, a, it's an asset that needs to be preserved, and we need to be proud of it, and we need to make it happen. And, and, and Richard, the consultant himself, said, and if you do that, based on all the money you're putting into it from the taxpayers, you've got to have the taxpayers have more leadership role in it. Um, so I just think you know, that, that's a necessity. Now, along with that comes a lot of uh, fear and trepidation, because we don't want to screw it up, right? 
we got a lot of expertise in place. My career was running departments and, you know, and being involved in being assistant city manager and assistant county administrator. I know organizations. I said this to the staff because I had a discussion with the lead staff. You know, you know, the best transitions are, are respecting the history, respecting the expertise. You know, yes, there's going to be some changes, but we don't want to blow up things and blow up stability when we've got some great stability and great pieces like food and beverage going over there. We need to really be careful. And I like the words, Jeff, you're thoughtful and uh, systematic was the managers on top of that. We, we have to really, uh, we have to do this well. We have to do it right. We have to know that, that you know, the underlying issue, it is about golf. I know nothing about golf, very little. Um, and so the expertise is very key. And um, but I, I am in favor of number four. I, I, I don't disagree either that the hybrid of the hybrid may very well be the thing. Um, I don't want to close any doors when we have a great food and beverage operation running. I don't want them running for the hills because we think we can get something that may be better when we don't even know it and we know other places have struggled with that. So I, I think um, all those things are important to me. Um, and I think having a, a board that is more community oriented. Um, what's been great, what I've heard from so many citizens is it doesn't matter the exact organizational rung of a board members or the city running the club. What's important is we find the best way to preserve the asset. And so that's my priority. That's my feeling. That's my priority. Um, I guess a couple other things, Jennifer, would just be when you bring this back, I'm assuming you'll have um, not just the funding sources and thinking of the staff issues and the contracts, but also how um, operationally, customer-oriented-wise, we're going to maybe put some of these capital changes into place, mm -hmm. what that whole timeline is going to be. Um, You know, the full restoration issue, I'll be honest. I mean, I, again, I probably 90% of people I talk to say this is a small group of people that want the full restoration. And there's a fear that that is just going to drive the um, golf course into being higher and higher fees, and it will drive the community feel of people in the community being able to play. And that alone has shifted me to, like, I don't want it. But again, that being said, I don't know that any of us up here really understand the side by side, mm -hmm. and and I, I, I maybe we owe that to ourselves and to the community, with the understanding that we're not going to drive this facility out of reach of our own community because it's about a community asset. Um, okay, I I think other than. I will say that I will be the first one to say I will, would hope to watch a Bucks game in the sports bar at the clubhouse. <coughs> but I respect the fact that it is about golf first, so it's whatever makes sense for golf. And the rest of it is important, you know, in terms of a place that you want people to go, but it's still about golf. So I tried to make that as coherent as I could. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Vice Mayor? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with uh, everything that's been said so far. Uh, Richard, you made the comments that uh, it's you, the course is the best you've seen it in your 14 years. And thank you for that because it kind of solidifies my feelings and comments that I have made on my three years as liaison on, uh, to the golf club on the, the quality of the board and it keeps getting better and better and the decisions are better and better. Um, and the quality of the course. Uh, so it's just, thank you for those comments. Uh, feel good. Uh, you know, I agree with, I don't know what else needs to be said. Uh, thank you both for the comments about the side-by-side -side comparison. Um, I even have concerns on, with, without bringing it back to the original course, what, what the, 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 the sweet spot is on the price for just the regular restoration. Um, on because we the eye should always be on the price that our residents. I never want to outprice the residents on what we do with the restoration, the uh, restoration of, of the course. Um, my concerns really are on whatever model we choose. I'm very happy to hear that two and three are out, one and four. I'm leaning toward four, but I do like a hybrid of the hybrid. Um, it's that food and beverage that makes me really uncomfortable, um, and 
especially the fact that I have no food and beverage background at all. And so things seem to be running well. We've got some restaurants that could come in, but is another restaurant in there, is that what we want? Or do we want that clubhouse feel? And how does that compare or contrast with the way restaurants are run? And that whole transition uh, kind of scares me. And that needs, that's, was my big fear and why I wanted the thoughtful transition to make sure that we get that right. Um, and without two and three, it sounds like that June deadline is now, we can, we can play with that a little bit. And that's just a huge relief to make sure that we just get it right. Uh, this is a community asset, and we've heard that throughout, uh, historic value. Um, but I really am interested on the original course and what that looks like. And it's no harm to take a look at that. And can we afford it? Can we not? What's it cost versus the value we get out of it? What's that look like as, uh, as a community as a whole to have that type of rich, historic golf club um, and course? Uh, so uh, let me see. I, you know, let's see, community feel. Uh, special events, right? How does special events, back to food and beverage, uh, correlate to what you can get at, at another restaurant? Um, <clears throat> and that concerns me, just another restaurant, that we seem to be excited about just another restaurant. And it's like when we were talking about the parking garage and what we could have around there, and we started the discussion on a restaurant or um, a theater downtown. And my thought was, is you don't want another restaurant, you want a <coughs> theater. If you have a theater that's going to bring a different... Um, group of people downtown and from that additional group then you get a restaurant but if you just put in a restaurant you're just going to get the same people they just now have one more choice so you really haven't added anything to the value of the downtown as far as bringing more people in and I think that's the same way with the golf club is that if you just slap in a restaurant you're going to you're not going to draw as many is is uh, as different than if you really take into consideration and put the right food and beverage source in, in there. Um, so with that, I just look forward to uh, what comes back to make sure that it fits with what's been said on the dais, what's been said uh, from the, the club members and what we're hearing in the community. And so that's all that I have. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Torga. <clears throat> Thank you. I uh, spent a lot of time reading the documents over and over, and I came to a position which I'm going to start off by summarizing very quickly. It seems to me like the whole focus of the entire project that we're dealing here should have been the course, and the course is called the Donald Ross course. And that's how it became famous, was through a Donald Golf course. We should have only been discussing what do we want to do with that course, how much money do we want to spend on that course, and why. Why would we spend money on that course? If I owned that course, that course is a tremendous asset. The problem is it's not been funded to the degree that it needs to be to be a Donald Ross, a calling Donald Ross course. Now, most of you all know that I've traveled a lot, and I spent a lot of time in the Far East traveling with the president of AMF International. I was in a sports group. I was with heads. I was a head ski and tennis guy, but I had to represent Ben Hogan because the Ben Hogan guy wasn't there. So we had a lot of, lot of folks. So every time I ride by the street that's called Ben Hogan over there, I get kind of excited. Every week, I stand and make a comment about that course, the Donald Ross course, and I make it, there's a song that goes, I'm on a boat, and every week I say, I'm on a golf course. And I say, look out at that, it's just beautiful. Uh, we have, we've had a golf course there that had definite problems in the past. Those problems were not ameliorated, or the problems were not fixed by us fixing the course. The problems were only fixed by guys like Chuck Crossman, John Falcone, and I won't mention any more people that are at the club, and then the board, and certainly, certainly Mike who's been with this for about four or five years now, trying to, get this, trying to get this going. I always talk about December or January 1, 1927. We're a great city here that's been developing. I've watched it develop when there was very little here. 
And we are now going to get even significantly bigger in who's going to be coming here and why they're going to be coming here. And there's going to be a lot of golfers in that group. We got Sterling, well, we got, we're going to hear them. We're going to hear them on, on Thursday. Uh, Joe is building right up here. We've got great hotels. When we talk about marketing, trust me, I was the vice president of marketing of a division of a Fortune 100 company. These folks have been talking about marketing. How do we, how do we market this better? They've been talking about that. I'll tell you how you market it better. We have an asset that needs attention. If I were going to sell my car, okay, I don't leave it as is. I go out and make sure it looks good. Okay, if I'm going to sell my, listen, I don't care. If I'm going to sell my house and it doesn't look quite so good, I'll bring a friend over and he's going to say, you should paint your house if you're going to sell your house. Some of these programs that were presented, the course, I don't think, is in a good enough condition, perhaps, to be enticing. There's some that are, and there's, and, and, to some, but if it were in pristine condition, that'd be a whole other matter. I think you'd be looking at one, two, three, and four, except I wouldn't, because that's not the problem. The problem is we should be looking at an asset that we own for the citizens of this city that is not only historical, but it is unbelievably quaint, beautiful, and well-known, and a drawing card for this city. To encumber it more by bringing in people that aren't sure about golf or I don't, I don't understand it. Okay, but I'll try to understand it. If that's the way we go, I'll try to understand that. But I've been around golf, I've been around, I've been around a lot of stuff. Okay, and when you have people that know how something works, then let them know how it works. And let, fine, they can present to the this, this city, particularly if the city's giving the money, most certainly. And the city may, may have other ways of, of enticing, other, other, other rates that they can get it to take over and advantage what this other group may, may come. We can change the other group a little bit for information that we wish to have on their, on their board. We're sitting up here trying to tell how to, how, how to run a golf board. Bring in a, bring, in a golf bring in a golf course and ask who they want on their, on their board. We got guys in here that have done that before. They'll tell you who they want on their board. Now we have to say, oh well, because we're a city, well, because now we're running like a city. How about this one? How about, how about do we have a, do we have an organization up here that's called an art facility? Dunedin Fine Arts Center. Center. Okay, how do they run? How about copying them? Let's go and copy them, see how they run. We know how they run. We know how they select their board. We know how that works. We have in Dunedin a gem, another gem that sits out there. We just jumped on property over here and got all everybody behind that property because everybody liked that property. And many people aren't going to go to that property. The golf course, okay? There's a lot of people aren't going to use that golf course. As we develop Dunedin and as Dunedin grows, and it's growing, that golf course will become a foundational point here. And we're talking about, we're not sure whether we should put two and a half or 2.75 or three, or somebody's trying to guess how much it could be. I can guess 20 million because if I want to put 20 million in, I'll put 20 million in. You gotta have a budget, you have a budget and you build it the best way you can. And if you know just to do the Donald Ross course, then here's what you do. When are we going to take care of our Donald Ross course? You remember, I hate to use this because this goes back to, this goes back to 2001, and I'm not done yet, but let's roll. Come on, let's fix the course. They don't have the money to fix the course. It's an asset for the city. We're not giving it to somebody else. We're keeping it. It's ours. Fix it. Then if we need to do anything different, that's fine. Why we're adjudicating or judging, I went through this and looked at it and said, I'm done. I don't need to do this. Don't need to. I don't need to work on any of those changes. I just need to say, fund the course, a Donald Ross course. Did I mention that I took, this, that I took a camera on my back in, 2000, in 1992 for the company I worked for, high tech simulation company, and drove the course. We put that course on a game called Greens, which was sold all through Europe. Why? Because it, 
was Dunedin. I, I, we put Dunedin on there. I made sure to put Dunedin on there. I was in a position to be able to do that. But because it was a Donald Ross course, those people over in Europe loved, they didn't know, they did, they didn't know anything, and it didn't matter the way you play it on a game. It didn't matter what course it was, but the pride of it being a Donald Ross course, the pride alone for our city is incredible. And we have marketing organizations here that can help, that will help. All of, all of this is, has been thought of. Mike, have you, I, no, I can't, uh, f never mind. I know Mark has talked about, I've sat there when we talked about marketing, okay? And I do know marketing. And many people know marketing. You take the product, you can have a, you can have a bad product and you can market it and sell it. But let me tell you the one most wonderful way. When I was the vice president of Head Ski and Tennis, number one tennis company, number one ski company, that's when you really like to market. And that's when you can really market. Because you don't have any hurdles. You don't even have any obstacles. Maybe you might have a little bit of a hurdle someplace to sell to somebody, but there's no obstacles. We have an obstacle out there. It's called a course that has a problem right now and it doesn't have to have one. We should be here, in my opinion, only talking about how do we get the money to upgrade that to a level that we are, we are all in agreement with from a cost standpoint, to play like a Donald Ross course. They are beautiful. They're lined with sand traps down the sides. They're easy to play. That's what he wanted. He did how many courses? 350 courses. I, f I forget how many courses he did. Did a dozen, lots of courses. We have lots of them here. We are not necessarily, in my mind's eye, a municipal golf course. We are a Dunedin golf course. We are a Dunedin marina. We have a Dunedin marina. We don't have a Dunedin municipal marina. We have a Dunedin marina. And whether you've set it up, I'm very familiar, been a chairman of the Board of Finance. Of course, we have enterprise funds. I know how enterprise funds work. This doesn't have to change to become an enterprise fund at this point in time. There's no reason for that, none whatsoever. But first of all, it can't even begin that way. We'd have to give them money to start. Don't give them any money. Give them the money to do the course. We own the course. Then see where we want to go. The food at the club is excellent. The service at the club is excellent. I haven't heard a complaint. I haven't heard a complaint from people in years about the club, honestly, have not. So, it, I hate to say it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The course is broke, fix it. So I'll end with this, fix it, let's roll. Don't wait till 1920, 2023, 2024 to fix the course. The course needs the fixing now. As fast as you can come up with the money, fix the course. It is an asset. If the asset is worth a dollar now, it'll be worth whatever you put into it plus. And then later, it's a foundational point. Just like we're doing the houses over here. We love the historical houses. That's historical course. The Marine Corps trained right off, the, right, right, off, right, off right down the street from there for the First World War. We've had all those players there, home of the PGA. That's where the PGA, I have been to the PGA shows where you almost had to rent the golf cart to drive around because it's a million to two, two million square feet. Here it was in the parking lot. But we, we're not gonna sell it on that. We're just gonna sell it on the fact we're gonna have a great playing golf course and we're gonna have a Donald Ross course we could end up having a seniors tournament here easily, easily. Big draw, huge draw. Let's roll. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I've listened to what everybody has to say as well as the folks that have come before us today. Um, I certainly do understand the passion. I was the liaison from 2006 to, I don't know, 2009, 10. I don't remember exactly, but a number of years. Um, and I have a 
pretty keen understanding as to what has occurred since then. Um, I think if we make a, a large scale investment that we have to have oversight. Um, and we've made some pretty large scale investments over the years. Um, I don't remember exactly when, but probably 2008, maybe 2009, the greens were redone. Um, I don't remember, there was a number of things that were redone, but it was a large scale improvement that was done out there. Um, it's unfortunate though, that the club has not been able to make enough money to be an enterprise fund to support the capital improvements to continue that maintenance. And that is what has occurred. Um, with our oversight, we're saying that we think we can make that happen. And I don't think it's gonna magically happen by redoing the greens again, because it didn't happen before. Um, I know the golf game has changed a little bit because of being outside and all of those things. Um, but there was a severe lack of maintenance going on on the course. Um, and very little marketing done. Since 2006, very little marketing. There has been marketing. I'm not saying there hasn't been any, but very little. And back when I was li liaison, what I always heard was we don't have enough money to do that. Um, so those big scale improvements, the club did pay for that. I believe there was a loan taken out, but I, I don't remember exactly. It's been a while. And then the city came in because the club needed money, and we bought a piece of their property to use for stormwater drainage. And it was a way to infuse money into the club, but also get a public benefit from it, right? So again, even then, we were thinking about how do we support all of the taxpayers? You know, how do we make this work well, but again, it was an, the need to infuse money. Um, then we started doing the extra maintenance things, like, well, first, then, no, then we purchased the clubhouse. Again, to get the mortgage off the back of the club, right, and infuse money. So that that money that they would have normally paid towards the mortgage would be going into it. So of course they're doing better with some of the things we've done, just saying, but again, now we own it. And then we started adding the, the annual things. I don't remember what they all are. I think some of it's mangrove trimming. Some of it's uh, giving the discount on the water bill, I think is one of them. I, I, there's a number of things and I don't remember them all. But then we started doing that. So again, supplementing the golf club because they couldn't afford to do all of this. Then we built the cart barn, and yeah, we know that was a you-know-what, but we still, we built it. I'm just saying over and over and over again, we have done this. So, and it's because there hasn't been enough um, extra cash, if you will, lean machine, which is always good, to do the projects that need to be done to sustain it. And I'm not saying that in any kind of a bad way, it's just a fact. And so something has to change, something. And I think if we take some version of option four, something will change. Yes, I think those greens need to be done. But I'm gonna tell you, that clubhouse looks like a nursing home and it needs to look better. No. I mean, it does. It, it deserves to look better. It deserves to be attractive. And you know, You'll remember this, Mike. We always talked about our club, our golf club, just has golf and the clubhouse. It doesn't have tennis courts or pools like Countryside or some of the other ones to be competitive. So in my mind, that clubhouse needs to be the amenity that you might add to the golf to be attractive where it would might keep you from driving over to Countryside or somewhere else. You know, not just the look of it, but the design of it, the, the food it offers, whether it's the same food people or somebody different. I'm, I'm not tied to either. I, I'm open. But I, I think that, you know, I, I absolutely think we have to have a, 
and it, um, a consultant that understands return on investment per square foot of restaurants and does the bar need to be bigger and or not or whatever how much outdoor seating is worth the investment kind of like looking at the Donald Ross versus the regular mm -hmm. we need somebody that has a has a you know expertise in that area and that's going to be money it's not going to be just $80,000 I'm thinking hundreds here mm -hmm. you know they might want us to move a wall or something I, I, I have no idea but I want to leave us open to that and get a, somebody just like we're we had an expertise on the Gulf side, right? We'll do the RFBs. I want somebody that will give us the, the, the club side and, and tell us what we need to do there because as Commissioner Franey said, if we're gonna do this, we need to do it right and give it its best effort and foot forward. And that's what I believe in. Now, all the, the stuff underneath, who's gonna be the general man? I know all of those things are really important and I don't I'm not trying to dismiss them I'm just trying to say I think the general consensus or the direction we want to give is when I choose option four some of those things under option four whether it's outside restaurateur or continuation with the people are there I don't have a dog in that fight yet I think it's simply just saying I know that the general operation has to change. Given the 15 years, almost 16 years that I've been watching, we're subsidizing it anyway. But this way, we can maybe bring more expertise, more funding. I don't think it's gonna feel like it changes to you, except improvement to the members, you know? But I absolutely think that on behalf of all of our residents, we have to have some oversight Somebody mentioned the Arts Center. We're not handing them money. I mean, we hand them a little bit of maintenance every year, 70,000, 70 something with, between in kind and cash. Yeah. But we're not giving them, they go out and raise their own capital money. One time have we given them money. And that was to match a grant. That was, was 500,000. That was a state grant. Right. Yeah. We're not giving them money, we're not. So it's, I just feel like we have to have that oversight. I think those are things are important. We, I think every one of us are extremely supportive of this asset. Hell, I'm trying to say let's spend more money on the, on the club too. You know, let's not just, for, let's not do this and then only attract, not attract a widespread group of people because the clubhouse isn't where it should be. Um, I don't know what's right on the restoration or not the restoration. I'd like to have some insight, but I can tell you that when we did get the emails about the restoration, it wasn't the board coming to us and asking us to have the Donald Ross. It was the golf men's group, even though some of them have been a part of the board. Because as soon as we got those emails, I called Mike right away. Is this the board recommendation? He said, no, it's not. Told me point blank. Um, so I think I'll have the dialogue, you know, I, I don't want to spend six months trying to figure it out either, but I mean, have the dialogue certainly. Um, I like the idea of a community style board, whatever that is, but just like, I don't remember, I think it was you, I don't remember who said it, but essentially the board that's that's running the club that's giving the direction to the people who are running the club let me say it that way our volunteers that asset deserves better I don't mean that in a bad way it means it deserves some some sincere expertise you know I mean that, that's a huge as everybody has said it's a huge asset and so when I say better I don't mean it against anybody but it deserves to have decision makers that are not just volunteers. And again, volunteer, you can accomplish so much through, through being a volunteer, especially when you're passionate about it. So again, I'm really not trying to say that anybody's done anything wrong, but 
I think it's really important for us if we're going to invest this kind of money of the taxpayer of the general citizens of Dunedin's money, then we have to have some expertise oversight. I think that's really, really important um, and, a, and a, a good use of the funds. Um, I think it should be an enterprise fund. I think we can take it to a place where it's supporting the capital needs, the ongoing capital needs, because just after this investment, that's going to get us through maybe 10 years, maybe. And then there's going to be another, I don't know, three or four million dollar investment that's going to be necessary. So this is not a, just a one-time investment like some of the other things that we've done. This is an ongoing that we're saying we're committing to. Um, so in idea, not in form, but in idea, I support option four. I think Jennifer has heard the concerns about, you know, expertise, consistency, transition, all of those things. I have some of my own opinions on it, but I think it's too early for me to even talk about it because I really want my experts to come back, you know, get, bring a restaurant expert too, come back and tell us what they think. Um, and, and how they think the best after you've had conversations with the club and anybody else that you feel you need to, to tell us what, what you think the direction is. But something has to change because we've had to subsidize. Maintenance has been low and not consistent. And so something has to change. And I think this could be it. Mayor, so. can I just make one request? Of sure. Um, and that is... Um, you, Jennifer, could you send up, set up some type of structure during all this for regular communication with Chuck and John and Mike and, and the people over there that are really have done an outstanding job? And I want to make sure, you know, communication is key because obviously we'd all feel the same way if we were sitting in their shoes and all this is being thrown around. So I just want to make sure I think the number one thing is just to be transparent and communicate with them on a regular basis so they kind of know, um, you know, they don't have to hear stuff through the grapevine. They're, they're hearing it from you. I think that as we um, establish the transition plan, after hearing all of your comments, that we need to re meet with them on a regular basis, specifically on that transition plan and all the aspects that are involved in that transition plan itself, for sure. Yes. I think, you know, any organization that I know of, if you're going through stuff like this, you know, you have a specific communication plan with the employees that have the ability to be impacted. And so I just think that we need to make that a really important piece. I would comment that, that you know, the vice mayor is a liaison and staff attends their meetings as well. There is communication between the two. This is a different type of communication yeah, in regards right, to a different right. subject. Thank you. Right. I just wanted to throw that on the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Canada? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so what, what I am hearing, um, at least from, I heard three want to go to option four. I heard one going back and forth, and I heard one wants to stay the same. Um, so can we at least say this? We'll give consensus direction to say pursue option four and bring back the plan. It's not a vote. It's just consensus, considering all the concerns that we've expressed. Absolutely, but I did say a hybrid of a hybrid might be well, what we're looking at. And so it wasn't just four or one. I said a hybrid of a hybrid because it makes I, sense to I me. I mean that. I mean that. I, I just don't want to call it something different. A hybrid. A hybrid. I, I just say option four. To me, I think the things under option four are flexible. Right. Keep your options open. Don't. Right. So I don't want to call it option 4.2 or something. I, I just want to say option four. To, I always love but, four point you know, two and four you've point now five. finally heard, all, you know, all of the concerns um, and what that transition plan might be. So for, Mayor, yes. uh, one uh, request for clarification. The, uh, the full restoration is side-by-side -side analysis. What exactly does that mean no, to I'm the commission? No, I'm just saying, can you give a differential? I mean, can you, uh, we've heard 3.8, then some of the people up here have said, nah, mm -hmm. just to do what, just the greens, teas, whatever, the well, is, irrigation is, is, is going to be poor. That, um, and that's all is, I'm asking. This is, the reason why I'm asking is this, there's a lot of work involved Yeah, I don't want to go and, too deep. Mm -hmm. no, I, just, I no, think we just I want a general, maybe a general differentiation. With the, you know, and the group that was doing it and, 
and look at it, and then y'all can talk to the golf club about it. That's you know, I don't think it has to be a big study. I know, what we could I, do is identify, here are the projects we plan to achieve under the sustainability plan. Right. Here Correct. are the additional projects that would have to be done if you did a, tra a full restoration Correct. plan. And here's and an estimate of what the, the, the cost, yeah, the cost differential is. And okay. also, would it affect the cost reality. of the players? Well, it's going to. That's a, that's a whole, that, that's going to be a little more challenging. Okay, okay. Well, I'll just okay. back off on I think that. It, but you know, I wasn't one, I, let's look at the cost. I was not as simple as dive on mm. that. I think but we I already was, know what it's going to say, but yeah. seeing it on paper. Okay. But I think what you said is perfect. That sounds perfect as a baseline because we don't think we have a good start with that. And then yeah. if it's intriguing, yeah. you can you can take it to take the it part. further. But again, there, there has been, at least by Mike, the club, Mike representing the club, there's been a concern expressed by, you know, you might add more players, but knock a bunch more out because of the difficulty of it. So, and, and that's what I, you know, and I, I wouldn't know that. that. I said, I don't want to cost the high, make the cost too high that then we end up, you know, not opening it to our community. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Thank you, Mayor. You understand, you've already expressed to us what the next steps are. Yes. And what you're going to work on. Um, were there any other thoughts that anybody wanted to make sure that Jennifer and the team and everybody else look at while they're doing this transition plan? I think you've all expressed it, but like I expressed, I want I want to see a restaurant consultant in there somewhere, or clubhouse design. consultant, whatever. It's a design consultant. Well, I guess the only thing, I just don't want anybody to lose sight of the fact that for the first time ever, this commission unanimously wants to make a major investment into this amazing asset. Yeah. And it's, I find that very exciting. And my only thought, Mayor, is if we are going to, and this leads to my comment about the theater, just the downtown con comment earlier, if we are going to consider outsourcing food and beverage to take that opportunity and not just plug and play, we don't want to be for Brady's there, for example. Oh, hell no. I need, I'm know, sorry. <laughs> that did so no. much. Right. <laughs> no. Even that is uh, horrendous. No. But, but even outside That's the box the concepts of, the club. of, and I don't know how deep you go with this, but my thought on make it a culinary school, because so, that's something different that would serve the purpose of food and beverage, but at the same time training staff for our existing restaurants here. So it's kind of a sustainability plan for food and beverage in, in the community. Just something outside the box that I think is worthy of at least consideration. That was interesting, I have to say. Well, um, again, I, I'm all about the legacy of history. And if we are not really um, celebrating that history and, and a really amazing historic asset, then you know, we've got to look at how we can do that because it is an amazing asset. It's an amazing historic asset. And we need to just sort of really enfold that into the community, whether you play golf or you just want to go out there and see it and have lunch or a drink or whatever. I mean, it needs to be sort of really enfolded so that there's not, okay, there's the golf club, here's the community. We somehow really want to look for ways to, to more intertwine those two. Any final comments, John? No, I still think, uh, I still want to just reinforce the fact that we need to give some better guidance, I think, as a, as a, uh, commission as to how much we're talking about spending on something like this and, and sort of sort of some thoughts about where we think it could go. And I think the experts are the current folks that are sitting out there right now that are the, that are uh, on the board. And, uh, and then also uh, we also have a general manager and, uh, and a golf pro that are, have tremendous history. And look at some of the people on that committee that we have. Holy smokes. So uh, I just leave that for, for staff. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out and sitting through a very long meeting. And thank you for their comments. Yeah, go have, yeah, go have lunch at the golf club. Yeah.
right. Maybe a beer. Yeah, too. Chuck, make sure you go feed everybody. <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about food for so long. I'm yeah. so hungry. They're macadamia grouper. Have you had it? All right. It's amazing. It's really amazing. So we're going to um, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Fence. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> All right. Uh, can we skip over commission discussion? There's nothing yes, emergency, yes. right? Okay. <laughs> nothing for city clerk update. Okay. City manager update. Anything that we need to know? Very quick update on the water treatment plant, Mayor. Okay, yes. A lot of yeah, folks have been, been asking you. Okay. I'll yes. Right All right, guys. We're just going to finish up <laughs> our meeting. Guys, we're going to finish up our meeting. So if we can keep quiet, let's be. We can't hear when, when y'all are talking out here. Okay, go ahead. Well, Mayor, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, this is an update on the water treatment plant uh, as requested during agenda briefings. Um, the work continues to pro progress on, at the water treatment plant since the fire. Uh, as you know, most of all the water processes are back online, making the water safe to drink, and that was almost immediate after the fire. The only process not online is the reverse osmosis process, which should be partially back online during the first two weeks of December according to our RO manufacturer. City staff, the insurance company, electrical and data subcontractors, and the RO engineer are working diligently to get the facility repaired to an operational functional status as soon as possible, and that's the reverse osmosis mm -hmm. portion. Once the RO reverse osmosis process is online, there will be a gradual reduction of hardness as the RO treatment water flushes through the distribution system. Interestingly enough, because we have 8 million, um, 8 million gallons uh, of water storage, not including the storage within the distribution piping system. Yeah, it'll take a while. Again. Yeah, introduction of the RO water will take some time to mitigate through the tanks and piping system. And just as an FYI, this is an interesting fact, I did not know this. Uh, water produced today at the plant can take up to a week to get to Honeymoon Island and Royal Stewart Arms. Hmm. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Wow. He doesn't know the way or what? No, apparently. Yes, He's got to find its way there. Interesting. Right over there. Do we have a cause yet? Because I keep getting asked. No. That's a good question. When not at this we? point. That's still under investigation. I, I'm not sure, Mayor. I, I can let you know. Um, okay. Can I say something? Because my neighbors came over and they said, you know, they were so interested in this, and they said, we did not really know how good we had it right. until we had this happen. And they said, when are we going to get it all back? I know. On? People are like, so, I mean, really I passionate thought that about was it. was such a wonderful comment. Yeah. And they will be so happy to hear that it will begin the yeah. first couple of weeks in December, we believe. Mm -hmm. Although it will take a while to infiltrate. Yes, yes. it takes a while to get through the pipes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, anything from you, Nikki? Yes, I have two items. First, the Dunedin Station parking lot closing email went out. You all should have seen that on November 18th. Mm -hmm. That was an expedited closing. We were not scheduled to close until the 29th, but we got that and the simultaneous bond closing done. Um, in your email, you'll find the results of the city clerk's research on the ORC um, Ordinance Review Committee, CRC Charter Review Committee data that the city clerk's office pulled, as well as the two decision points that it would be helpful for the city commission to be considering before your um, the next meeting in, in December on the 14th, when we'll bring this up again in the um, city attorney report just a quick summary of the 15 communities that were surveyed only one other city had both a CRC and a ORC that met every five years that's the city of Oldsmar of the remaining 14 which only have a charter review committee two meet every five years one meets every six years one is every seven years five or every 10 years three were at the direction of the city commission with no time prescribed Two, have no charter review committee required by their charter. One still does by resolution approximately every 10 years. So that data is in your emails. Take some time to look at it. Just like I said before, you all talked about enough today. So I just want you to know it's there and to look at it if you can over the next two weeks. It's in the mail? It's in your email. That's yes. very interesting. And I want to thank Rebecca and well, her team for don't jumping. Don't well, interrupt you, but don't forget Olsmar's... Uh, who is Olsmar's city attorney? I believe they're represented by Tras Daniel. Yeah, but who? Yeah, so Hubbard was their attorney. Before. Oh, yeah, John. I believe yeah. John historically was their attorney. But just saying, I didn't look at who's representing. Who no, but I'm just saying that's that's how that happened. Well, remember this, and you'll have the other dates in there too, such as you know that we talked about in the first time that this came up. So there's and your and your decision points. So don't want to belabor the point, but thank you all for the opportunity to summarize. Sure. Okay. Uh, 
Any final commission comments or can we adjourn? Well, I just wanted to say in seven minutes, I will be meeting with staff on how we can further light up our downtown per the delegation from this commission that I could do that. So uh, to be continued. You if you have any input, go for it. Are you smoking? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> you know, I, I would never smoke. I will tell you, and because I can do it on open days, mm -hmm. tell them to do something like Joe's tree. It, Joe, it's amazing. It is a gorgeous. It's amazing. What are we talking about? Joe's tree? Joe, it, 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 Joe who? Strahan's. Joe okay, Kate at he did, he oh, did that tree. It. it is go amazing. Go down it at night. And they also did it down Broadway. And yeah. it's and amazing. It's amazing. Very cool. Uh, then I went back to look at ours, and I went, oh, my. Are you guys going to order lunch at 2? I mean, No, we're out of here. here. Yeah. All right, we done? Uh -huh. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for staying late. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.